one more minute as we try to figure out why the stream isn't displaying properly, then we'll make sure nobody's missing anything. Again, my apologies. No, we will wait. Okay, sounds good. Oh, and Supervisor Hopkins has made it. Oh, perfect. So, um, picking, uh, were we picking up with the uh, approval of agenda? Is that right? That's correct. So, we're approving then the agenda with no changes, correct? Okay. Okay, so I'll do my roll call here. Che? Hi. Scott? Yes. Marty? Yes. Paul? Yes. Abby? <clears throat> yes. Wanda? Yes. Liz? Yes. Brooks? Yes. And Kathy? Yes. Okay. Uh, we'll move on to the statement of any conflicts of interest. Uh, are there any uh, conflicts of interest that need to be brought up? No. Okay. I'll take that as a no. Um, is there any correspondence, Scott? Um, none. Okay. And we'll, I'll hand it over to you, Scott. All right. We're onto the consent calendar. <clears throat> um, approval of the March uh, meeting minutes. One, one little um, yes. thing is I noticed the, the contact information about the um, uh, band, the Kashaya band. Oh. Pomo Indians, it um, said Bank of Como, Pomo Indians. So I just wanted to oh, clarify it in, band, that yes. they don't have a bank. <laughs> oh, okay. okay. Thanks for catching that. Okay. Um, and then I had one. Uh, on, Kathy. Okay. On page eight, when we're talking about, um, my, in my comment, I talked about the, the large coyotes that were across the road. It's spelled C-O-Y-O-T-E-S, coyotes. Not, okay. it was just a, yeah, oh, that's yeah. it. <laughs> Second line. Yeah. Okay, got it. Any other um, corrections? Okay, we'll include the ban uh, band instead of bank and we'll, we'll uh, correct coyotes. And I'll go through and we'll, um, I'll do a roll call here to approve or Che? Aye. Okay, Scott? Aye. Marty? Aye. Paul? Yes. Abby? Aye. Wanda? Aye. Liz? Aye. Brooks? Yes. And Kathy? Aye. Okay. Thank you. Uh, the Lower River Mac and um, myself and Elise um, <coughs> together <clears throat> and tried to uh, come up with a uh, updated land use committee process. Uh, and uh, that was sent out in the packet. Uh, and were, are there any comments or, um, and then we approve that. Brooks. Um Scott, I, I didn't really see any difference from what we had um, were working by last, uh, well, the prior meetings. So um, what, what is the difference? Um, are there any major differences? Um, Elise, you wanna run through that or I, I can touch on it? 
Whichever you prefer. The, the, the main difference is that we, there will now be a standing committee and a standing committee is subject to the Brown Act rules. So there will be a monthly standing committee that will have uh, an open meeting with notes and, and those that standing committee will review every single permit um, application that comes through our office that pertains to the coast and then pick out the ones that seem um, um, worthy of review um so for example if you're gonna if you're gonna put up a tough shed in your backyard we don't really want to review that but if there is something for a development of a hotel on the coast we do want to review that so the standing committee will be looking at those and bringing them up um so that's really the the biggest change right and, and we're gonna have two two um people on the committee which gives us the flexibility of adding people that um, may want to be on the committee for a particular permit evaluation that it's in their neighborhood. or uh, So we have flexibility to, we have a base of two with the flexibility to expand to four uh, based on the event or uh, land or um, permit. I also wanted to um, state that uh, in the definition of land use, it includes events. Right. Thank you. Anything else? Yes, yeah, Scott, it's Paul. Yes. Um, I'm assuming that Permit Sonoma is fully uh, on board with this process. Hi, Elise again. <laughs> She's shaking her head, yes. Oh, yeah. Sorry, I thought I was muted. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, this will this will be just fine. Okay. Any other comments, questions? Okay, Cindy. Great, well, another roll call vote here. Che? Aye. Uh, Scott? Aye. Marty? Aye. Paul? Yes. Abby? Aye. Wanda? Did we, I know Wanda was having mic problems. No, it's me. Hi. <laughs> oh, there she is. Okay. Liz? Hi. Hi. <clears throat> Kathy? Hi. Okay, great. Thank you. Okay, on to um, public comment on matters not listed on the agenda. Comment from the public regarding items not on the agenda, but related to the Sonoma Coast Act business. Pursuant to the Brown Act, the Sonoma Coast Map cannot consider items, consider issues, or take action on any requests during this comment period. Due to time, time constraints, comments will be limited to two minutes. Uh, and there'll be a timer that will come on at about 30 seconds left. Um, and um, any um, public comment? Are there any uh, hands raised, Jason? We currently do not have any hands raised. Nope, we have one hand raised by C. Higgins. C, yes, please. Go ahead, C. Hi, good evening, everyone. Um, I'll just take a moment of your time. I wanted to provide you with three quick updates in regards to happenings here on the coast. Um, number one, at the last meeting, I had talked about the US Fish and Wildlife um, mouse eradication project at the Farallon Islands. Um, they were or are planning to use 1.5 um, metric tons of a very toxic, chemo, uh, toxic chemical brodipicum. And so that was, I had come on to let people know that that was going to be before the Coastal Commission as a special hearing, but I wanted to come back to say that that hearing has been delayed. It was scheduled first in May then moved to June. And now the earliest it could come back is September. But I do advise people to stay vigilant with this issue. Um, I think it was sort of the general opposition and those of you that wrote letters of concern to the Coastal Commission, um, they were effective. But I suggest that you know we, we keep an eye on it and you can get a lot of news at savetheferalons.org on all the updates with that. Um, the other thing I wanted to let folks know is that tomorrow, the Greater Fairlands National Marine Sanctuary is having their Sanctuary Advisory Council meeting. 
that's an all day meeting, but you can find their agenda online. They will be providing a very detailed update on the American Challenger, uh, the boat, the 100 gross ton boat with the 17 oil tanks that grounded just south here of Bodega Bay. And so I will also be presenting a resolution on a way to deal more effectively with grounded vessels along the Sonoma coast. So you can access that tomorrow. And then also we have the LCP workshop next week on the 25th. And I hope you guys touch on that a little bit too in front of the board of supervisors. So that's the uh, coastal news. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, C. <clears throat> Are there any other hands up? Yes, yeah, so we have a hand raised by Larry Needleman. Okay, Larry, please. Larry, go ahead and unmute yourself. Well, Larry has lowered his hand. Okay. Anyone else? That um, we have Tom and Prudy Tucker. Okay. Tom and Prudy, go ahead and unmute yourself. Do you hear me now? Yes. I would like to add on to C's uh, LCP uh, request to address uh, the rodenticide being passed out in the fair lines. I'd also like to see uh, the LCP address Roundup, a glyphosate-based uh, uh, weed killer that all of our or most of our gardeners used in our communities. Uh, it's been identified as a carcinogen. I'd like to see the LCP ban it. That's my opinion. Thank you. Okay, thank you. And Jason, anyone else? We do not have any comments on Facebook and no hands are raised in the attendees. Okay, thank you for commenting those that did. Um, moving on, uh, regular calendar items. Um, Supervisor Linda Hopkins is here, I understand. And I, I believe she has some opening comments and, and also she'll be swearing in our new alternate, Brian Lubitz. I hope I spelled or pronounced your name right alternate for Bodega Bay. Thank you for um, joining. Linda? Thank you so much. And maybe we can um, sort of first handle Brian swearing in. So okay. Brian, if you want to go ahead and unmute, and it'll be pretty simple. I'll try to make sure I pause enough. Just repeat after me with one exception. I will say, I state your name. State your name. Don't say state your name. Yeah. So aside from that, it should be smooth smelling. So um, go ahead and raise your right hand. I state your name. I, Brian Lubitz. Do solemnly swear. Do solemnly swear. That I will support and defend. That I will support and defend. The Constitution of the United States. The Constitution of the United States. And the Constitution of the State of California. And the Constitution of the State of California. Against all enemies. Against all enemies. Foreign and domestic. Foreign and domestic. That I will bear true faith and allegiance. That I will bear true faith and allegiance to the Constitution of the United States, the Constitution of the United States, and the Constitution of the State of California, and the Constitution of the State of California, that I take this obligation freely, that I take this obligation freely, without any mental reservation, without any mental reservation, or purpose of evasion, or purpose of evasion, and that I will well and faithfully, and that I will well and faithfully, discharge the duties, discharge the duties, upon which I am about to enter. Upon which I'm about to enter. Congratulations and welcome to the Municipal Advisory Council. Thank you. Thank you so much for being part of this process. Yeah. Thank you. Welcome, Brian. Thank, Thank you. you. So um, with that, I do have just a few things that I wanted to let everyone know about. Um, I will be saving my remarks on fire services funding um, to when I'll be pre um, presenting with Assistant Chief Hertzberg 
on the item um, as well as with Mark Bramfit later on in the agenda. But I do want everyone to know um, the local coastal plan, as you are all aware, is moving forward in the process. And in fact, um, it will be coming before the Board of Supervisors for another update next Tuesday at 1.30 p.m. So I'd encourage everyone to participate in that. Um, the good news is that it is a time certain, so hopefully you won't have to be waiting around for too long. And I want you to know that in terms of what I've been hearing from constituents and from coastal constituents that I plan to raise as critical issues, number one, um, sort of vacation rentals and how quickly we can move forward with actual kind of regulations around vacation rentals as opposed to putting that on a future to-do list for the local coastal plan, because I'm, I'm increasingly hearing, particularly from the North Coast section, that folks would like to see some kind of reasonable um, regulations implemented. Also the issue of pesticides as um, a public commenter just recently raised, if there are ways that we can kind of put some controls in there. And then thirdly, um, which will also come up of course later in the agenda is the issue of emergency services out along the coast. And it feels as though th those three issues are not adequately addressed in the draft that we have to date. Um, that is my major coastal update. So um, I will have more to say later, um, but I also actually, before I hand it back to our chair, just want to say thank you so much um, to Sheba and Claudia for joining us this evening. And just a brief introduction um, of Sheba Person Whitley, our fearless director of the Economic Development Board. She has really come in um, with a desire to really kind of change the way that the EDB operates and to really bring a focus on equity, bring a focus on communities that have really struggled, particularly to recover post-disaster. And so I'm excited for her to have the opportunity to share a little bit about that work today. Um, but with that, I would hand it back to you, Chair Farmer, unless there are any questions. Are there any questions? Well, we'll have time later to ask questions during. Um, okay, um, moving on, uh, we're, um, Claudia, Becchio uh, from Sonoma County Tourism and Sheba Person Whitley of the Economic Development Board are here to um, talk about the, uh, what they do and, uh, and we're gonna look at it relative to the transient, transient occupancy tax. Um, so first, uh, Claudia, um, if you have, uh, the floor is yours. Thank you. I, I have a presentation. I'm not sure if I can share my screen. Uh, I think you can. Is that something you're able to do yourself? Oh, it might be. Okay. There we are. Can you all see that? Mm -hmm. Yes. Excellent. So I, I appreciate the time tonight to talk a little bit about what Sonoma County Tourism um, is doing for on behalf of the coastal area of, of Sonoma County. It's difficult for us to parse out transient occupancy tax specifically as it relates to this area. Um, but I will talk about what we sort of do with, with the TOT and how the TOT spending differs from the um, business improvement area. And then um, kind of the, the issues and the uh, sort of the opportunities that we see out on the coast. I will tell you, and you probably know this, but I came into Sonoma County uh, about four years ago, but I've been coming to Sonoma County for decades because my father uh, and his wife, Lissa, lived at lived in the harbor. And so uh, really Bodega Bay was where I fell in love with Sonoma County. So it's a, it really, it's, it means a lot to me and to, um, to what we are able to share with the world, frankly. Now, let me see if I can advance this. So a little background, I just, uh, you probably again all know this, but uh, Sonoma County Tour was, Tourism was established in 2005. Um, and per our TOT agreement with the county, we as the contractor is designated in the county's advertising program policy as a recipient of transient occupancy tax for advertising and promotional efforts. So uh, our whole sort of reason for being is to create um, advertising and it's I mean, that has evolved tremendously since 2005, but and promotional efforts for um, the County of Sonoma. We're funded with two sources, and that is through the transient occupancy tax, of which at the moment we get 1.25 points of the first nine points of TOT collected in unincorporated Sonoma County. And I'll talk about this difference here in a second. And then we also have a business improvement area, and that is the lodging. Um, receipts of which we get 2% of, of lodging receipts on participating municipalities. So that's unincorporated Sonoma County as, as well as municipalities that are 
that do not include Healdsburg and the town of Sonoma. So per legislation, that those dollars must benefit those participants of that area. So it really is um, the, the beneficiaries are the hotels and the lodging, um, what they often call themselves investors in that part of our funding. So kind of going back to TOT, the, the importance of TOT for us, because we don't have that um, sort of mandated legislation about how those dollars are spent, this allows us to promote non-lodging entities such as restaurants, retail, I mean, the outfitters and those who are providing tours and the tour operators. So that's, a, that's an important differentiation and why TOT for Sonoma County Tourism is so critical because it does give us that broader uh, ability to really elevate the extraordinary experiences that we have certainly in the culinary, um, some of the great tours and other things that the experiences that people can have while they're in Sonoma County. Just to, if both of these, um, tax bases and funding sources are generated only as a result of overnight lodging. So transient occupancy tax doesn't just happen when visitors come, it only happens as a result of overnight lodging. So our charge is always to promote those who stay in a hotel or in an overnight accommodation uh, because that's the only way that this, that this generate, this, these, these funds are generated that's the best way for us to help support the county. And that's really what our, uh, what our mission is, is to be a supportive entity for uh, Sonoma County. We are in fact a revenue generating organization. Lots of times it's sort of seen as, you know, we're, we're given this, um, these funds, but in fact we give back funds. So for every dollar invested in tourism marketing, $166 comes back to Sonoma County and visitor spending and $6.90 comes back in taxes. So, you know, do we pride ourselves on this ability and the capacity to generate revenue for, for the county? And, uh, you know, when we have uh, years, which thankfully we haven't, but when we have impacts like we had with um, the coronavirus and certainly some of the big fires and our capacity to generate funds is limited, that's, um, that's not, we don't, that's not a good thing for us. We are really, the, this capacity to generate um, taxes is important. So we do, on behalf of, of the coastal area, we are, we are very mindful of the need to protect and preserve this incredibly fragile environment, but we also are very mindful of the need to promote the businesses out there. So it's a constant balancing act and again, something we are working really hard to be sure we are mindful of that balance. So we started, and many of you were probably part of this Let's Talk Tourism initiative kind of back four years ago when we went around the county because we knew there was um, some, uh, there was an increasing level of, of consumer uh, and visitor, no, <laughs> resident unrest about how about the impacts of tourism on the county and very much understandable, but back in 2016 and 2017, we went around the county for this let's talk tourism piece. We wanted to get people's input and uh, understand what the issues really are. And those issues have in many ways exacerbated since that time, uh, but we certainly did begin to understand what the issues are and have incorporated them in our strategic planning ever since. We moved to a destination stewardship organization in 2019. And what that really means, it means all these things that are here, but we moved from being a numbers driven organization to a quality and revenue driven organization. So instead of just, you know, touting that the number of tourists came to Sonoma County, keep the numbers keep growing. That is no longer a viable or really interesting number for us because those are not the right visitor. Those are not those who can res will respect and, and protect our natural environment along with enjoying all that Sonoma County has to offer. So we've had starts and stops with getting that off the ground certainly, uh, but that is still the foundation for Sonoma County um, tourism and really the mantra by which we are incorporating some new programming certainly for this summer. Throughout um, the pandemic, we 
we're very mindful of continuing to engage by uh, people in the, the discussion around Sonoma County. And about uh, midway through, we launched the Safe Travels Promise Program, which many of you may have seen, but it really started that conversation about when you come into Sonoma County, travel safely, be mindful, um, and certainly follow the protocols. Uh, so, so we are just continuing that stewardship ideology around how we promote Sonoma County. Post pandemic and starting this summer, we are in a partnership with the regional parks um, and a national organization called Leave No Trace. Leave No Trace has seven principles that they um, tout and really communicate in a number of different ways. And it is really about mitigating those issues that tourists who are behaving badly leave behind. And so it's the trash, it's the, you know, the, the floats, it's um, the way they interact with neighbors and the respect they have for people's um, neighborhoods and, and the fact that they are coming in and leaving again. And that, that just sort of overall um, respect for the destination. And we think it's really important that we, along with the parks, talk about this and make sure that people um, understand the importance. Uh, we're working through what those initiatives are gonna look like, but right now we do know there will be a summer radio campaign. And in that campaign, it will be all about travel safely. If you're coming to the coast, if you're coming to the Russian river, um, you know, here's, here's how you travel responsibly. And, and so that's, that continues to be a really important piece of what, what we do. Along with that, really in the idea of, of protecting and preserving, we did the tourism cares um, to a coastal cleanup out in uh, out in the in your area, and it was a big one. People people were very enthusiastic about um, having an opportunity to clean up the coast. It's been a couple of years since we did that, um, but it's a, it's an important piece. Tourism cares continues to be an important piece of what we do in terms of giving back to the community. Um, you probably heard we did. The board of directors did approve $75,000 of partial funding for the Bodega Bay um, for an ambulance out there with your emergency management uh, service and very, you know, we are committed to helping them. Um, we also have a new accredited hospitality professional program. Some of you may have been CTAs, um, but that's evolving and we have a accredited hospitality professional program and uh, visitor safety, including coastal safety, how to be mindful of our natural resources. That's all part of our fundamental training that these, um, what we're calling AHP um, participants will be doing. But we also know we have this balance and uh, your businesses, the lodging, retail restaurants, they need visitors. They need um, people to be in those entities generating dollars. So to do that, we, um, we have a paid media campaign that we have kicked off for the summer and will continue to kick off. Um, it's, it's really talking about our brand, um, Sonoma County Life Opens Up, which we couldn't be luckier to have that brand right now, but it, it does invite people to come out to Sonoma County. I will tell you, we don't at the moment have a coastal image, but that was by request that we're not driving people out to the coast for general visitation. Um, and that's just because we're really trying to focus on the protect the area. We know people are gonna come out to the coast. Um, so our focus is protection. Um, promoting is um, uh, we're working for the uh, kind of the rest of Sonoma County, but certainly keeping your businesses in mind. So we will convey um, if a hotel has a special or I have Bert's wonderful um, Jenner by the Sea. I, if, if that has something that we wanna convey, we certainly will support the businesses like that, but we do wanna be very mindful of the overarching um, invitation out the coast. We do continue to do a number of trips uh, with the media and influencers and people who talk about Sonoma County. Again, they know that the responsible travel message has to be part of what they do. Um, they continue with social media posts. Uh, the coastal entities, certainly the Bay Lodge and um, In at the Tides, wonderful place for incentive travel. So for business executives and others to bring, you know, their, their best salespeople or other kinds of incentive trips 
uh, we continue to work those leads and to work on talking about those properties out there in, in uh, drive business in that way. So it's a, I, you know, I, it, I just really want, and I hope that I've been able to convey that we are trying to do that balance between protecting your area and promoting it and keeping the businesses vibrant and alive and, uh, you know, continuing to survive in a very, very difficult uh, time for them. We know that the coast has an extraordinary appeal for our entire, entire group of travelers, for locals, weekenders, international travelers. I mean, this is just such a gem for Sonoma County um, that we spend our TOT dollars certainly um, on both protecting and preserving the area. Uh, we work closely with the Bodega Bay Chamber on various initiatives and we'll continue to do that. Um, and we listen to them when they say, please keep people, you know, don't promote uh, Bodega Bay. Uh, but we do promote the businesses because those are our partners and we want to be very mindful of that. And you know, really, lastly, we want to understand your issues. We want to find solutions. We want to advocate on your behalf, mitigate tourism impacts. We want to be solutions based and we want to work with all of you to make sure that we aren't doing things or saying things or inviting people in um, and having them negatively impact your area. Uh, there, there's messaging we can do. There's various ways that we can do that call out that does help to protect the area. I haven't talked about like volunteerism and other kinds of things that we could, we could do more of, um, but that's sort of yet to come as we continue down this protect and preserve um, uh, road. So that's what I have for you. And I hope that kind of gives you an idea of how we spend our dollars. And my cat's about to jump up here. I hope he's not in the picture. <laughs> Um, but uh, if you have any, obviously I'm ha happy to answer any questions. I will tell you um, that Sonoma County Tourism, when we went into the pandemic, our budget was about $8 million. And that's, that's a, kind of a mid-range budget for, um, for international uh, destinations like ours. Uh, we, it came down to about 5.2 during the pandemic, and we think it's going to go up to about 6.5. We're forecasting next year. Um, of, of that, about 2 million is, is uh, TOT, and the rest comes through the uh, business improvement area. So I'm happy to answer budget questions as well. But um, so that's Sonoma County Tourism and our efforts as they relate to the coast. Thank you, Claudia. We'll hold questions until after Shiva talks. Um, if that's fine. Um, so get our screen back, thank you. Um, Shiba, Shiba um, please, the floor is yours. Sure, thank you so much. And thank you for having me. Shiva Person Whitley, Executive Director of the Economic Development Board. I do not have a formal presentation. So I really just wanted to share with all of you a little bit about what we do, um, because I know some people have heard of EDB and some people haven't. I will start by saying that um, I know that there were some questions about the budget. So um, of our budget for EDB, um, 1.7, I'm oh, sorry, let me rephrase, 1,077,000 of the um, proposed new budget will come from general fund and grant fund sources. Um, 1.624 will come from TOT and we will have um, in our proposed budget 632,000 approximately thereabout that will fund Creative Sonoma because I know some people are familiar with Creative Sonoma. They've heard of that organization. That is actually a division within EDB. So I wanted to provide um, some context in terms of where our funding comes from. So again, that's around 1,077,000 that's gonna come from general fund and grant sources and 1.6 that comes from TOT. And um, certainly we wanna do everything we can to always be good stewards of that funding. And so then it always moves into the next question, well, what do you do? And long story short, we are here to support business. Um, we do a tremendous amount of business assistance in our department, and that is at every phase of business. So if you are an entrepreneur, your startup, if you are an existing business who is trying to expand, if there um, are opportunities to really look at growth, 
or if a business is at risk of leaving and we want to retain them, we want, we want to make sure we can keep them here, we do all of that. It is everything from providing market research to understanding your competitive advantages, um, to understanding you know, what are the high growth um, opportunities, talent attraction and workforce is a huge part of that as well. Access to capital, whether that be grants, loans, all and everything in between. Um, we do that in our department. We also oftentimes get questions about, well, what are those key industries? Who are you focusing on? And so I had a great conversation with Supervisor Hopkins in the past couple of weeks about, you know, it's this really, it's this mix. It is those traditional industries like ag and tourism and hospitality. Um, but also we look at data and what that's showing us about the potential for some of those high growth industries. And so that's healthcare, that's construction, that's craft beverage, um, supporting the creative economy, supporting film. Um, we also do that in our department. And of course, broadband is a huge part of what we do in our department as well. And so we, we try to make sure that we are responsive and that we are providing a suite of services that are timely and relevant again, to support our businesses at every phase. Um, and, and also being acutely aware that there are times just like the past you know, 14, 15 months where you have to adjust mm -hmm. and you have to not only do all those traditional things because we are actually still getting a ton of calls for startup assistance. People want help. Um, people are trying to figure out what's their next move. Some people um, are looking at this opportunity wait, wait a minute, I've been displaced. Um, I don't know what's going to happen with the future. Maybe they were laid off. Maybe the traditional industry that they had worked in and had been had a successful career in for 20 years, and maybe that's going away and they're trying to figure out their next move. And so we have been doing a lot of that, but of course been um, have been very responsive to COVID-19 and being acutely aware of some of these um, specific assistance that businesses really needed in order to help them survive COVID. Um, we were thankful that the Board of Supervisors did provide us with um, two and a half million dollars worth of uh, you know, stabilization grant funding that we were able to make available for the most um, vulnerable and the hardest hit. 80% of those grant recipients were low to moderate income because we recognize that that's who needed it the most. And unfortunately, there was never gonna be enough to go around, but we knew that we needed to be able to, again, be responsive. Um, we've heard over and over again about language access, particularly for some of our monolingual or our bilingual population, making sure that people had access, especially around COVID because everything was happening so rapidly and it was changing so quickly. So making sure that everything that we were doing was available in English and Spanish so that those businesses and those entrepreneurs were, were able to have access to that same timely relevant information. Um, we did a lot uh, early in COVID around understanding all the diff different shelter in place orders, what you could do, what you couldn't do. I am so excited that we are moving rapidly towards June 15th, it couldn't get here fast enough. We, we recognize that this has been an unprecedented time for our small business community. They've been decimated, quite frankly. And, you know, knowing what they've been through, you know, being able to open, knowing that there's probably gonna still be some mitigation, you know, at least in the very beginning, um, but people need to be able to, you know, get back to business. And um, there's so many who have lost so much and we are you know, acutely aware of that. And we're here to continue to be advocates for those most impacted. Um, and I know I mentioned workforce earlier, we are hearing a lot of product, probably the same thing that you're hearing, challenges around workforce. And what does that look like? And so we are having those difficult conversations with our local employers um, to say, well, how do we you know, be really thoughtful about bringing people back into the workforce? We from our perspective, I don't think it's a case that people don't want to work. It's that people need a livable wage. And I'm very aware that for some of the businesses that can be a, a challenge, but we also know that people want to come back to work. 
but they um, have, some of them have struggled for a very, very long time. And so it's, it's you know, one of those situations from our perspective, we do what we can to continue to advocate for businesses, but also bringing the information to them in a very thoughtful, tactful way to say, oh, okay, here's some of the challenges our workforce is having. And how do we think about this in a more comprehensive way so that we bring people back in, in a situation where they're, they're better off than they were before COVID happened? Because again, so many have been through so much. And so an example of that is we do have a job board, um, Sonoma County Connections that we've created uh, specifically around workforce opportunities. Um, we do actually have a workforce development specialist that really, again, is working both sides of that from the employee and the employer side, understanding you know, where the opportunities are, um, doing a lot of customized training, pulling down federal funding, making that federal, making sure that our local employers know that that federal funding is available for customized training to get their workforce back in full force so that they can continue to operate um, to a greater capacity. Um, we recently partnered with the Russian River Chamber on a job fair. We do that type of thing a lot. I think um, it's one of those situations where such a small department, we only have 14 full-time employees, so we're very, very small. And in order to really get to capacity, we have to partner quite a bit. We work with chambers, we work with the rotaries, we work with community-based organizations, and we actually go out all over the county. And if we are doing something, we wanna make sure it's accessible. Um, we've partnered with so many organizations all over the county to make sure that if we can set up a local assistance center, they let us come in and utilize their um, their office space so that people can, you know, for example, access a grant application to be able to apply for it. We've, we've done a lot of that type of thing and we will continue to do that type of work. Um, in addition, I think a lot of people have heard of some of our events. So Restaurant Week is done by our department, um, State of the County, Spirit of Sonoma, those types of things have been done by our department and sometimes people don't necessarily always affiliate them with the county, but our department is the one that does those events. And the past year has been quite, you know, stressful, right? Trying to figure out how to still support the community um, and do those events virtually. We will be doing, interestingly enough, um, Spirit of Sonoma this Friday, but we're doing it at a park. Um, so we're so thankful to our partner, Burt Whitaker at the parks for allowing us to do that. And it's going to be, outdoors and instead of having this big event it's going to be individual so all the awardees show up at, at a, a lot of time they'll get their you know opportunity to have their picture taken and receive their award and so we've been um trying to do lots of different things in that way doing a lot of virtual events a lot of webinars and making sure that you know again that whatever we're doing is timely is relevant it meets the need you know promoting business um, of course, safely, I always have to say that because we're still in COVID, promoting that people are doing things safely and, um, you know, supporting our small business. That is what we do. And I guess with that, with that, I'll, you know, stop talking. And if anyone has any specific questions, I think Mr. Farmer was saying we'll wrap that up um, at the end. But, you know, certainly we are here to, you know, support business and, and be an advocate, particularly for small business, because oftentimes, Sometimes they don't have anyone um, speaking on their behalf or they don't have the resources. And so those are the ones that we are here to, to really be the champions for. Thank, thank you. you. Yeah, thank you. Uh, I wanna acknowledge the Economic Development Board's role in rural broadband. It's been an ongoing um, issue and uh, your, your, part, your efforts are very much appreciated on that front. So let, let's have our um, questions now for the two of you. And uh, let's first um, go through the council members and see if there's any questions or comments. Um, uh, any council members would like to, I see Brooks. Brooks, do you have any questions for either? Um, not really a question, but um, hi, Claudia. Have a suggestion maybe for you if it, it would ever work out. I just thought it for your advertising that would, you know, be great if say you could donate a few trash bins or mm -hmm. maybe a porta potty, decorate them and, and say they're 
from um, Sonoma County tourism or something like that, that would really help Bodega Bay and I know Jenner a lot too, if we could add to um, some of the needs we have out here. And one other thing we would really like to get started is um, a shuttle bus. We could get a shuttle bus going around and perhaps you could decorate that and um, advertise that it is Sonoma tourist um, department. Well, that, that's a great idea. You know, we were thinking mm -hmm. about uh, incentivizing people. So having trash bags, because you know, people, behavior has changed if they get incentivized to change their behavior. So we were thinking about, you know, having trash bags available for people. And if they would turn in the trash bags all filled with, you know, with their trash, we would give them coupons or something like that. So I'm, I'm with you on the, the trash bag situation and, and we'll, we'll definitely think about that. And um, it's a great okay. idea. Yeah, Thank so anyway, you. I thought some, somehow if, if you could use it with the advertising um, funds instead of actually putting you know, ads in magazines and newspapers or something, have it here locally so the people who do come here know who is, you know, supporting the area and um, striving to, um, you know, have a, have a better area, safer Great place. thought, thank you. Yep. Thanks. Uh, Kathy, do you have any yeah. question or comment? Um, <clears throat> the one comment that I have since, is that we have 30 miles of state parks. So the county parks and the county tourism board, it appears like you're you know, trying to deal with this issue, but I don't know if it's possible to get two government entities to work together because state parks is a huge, the overuse of state parks is also a huge issue here on the coast, all the way up to Guadalajara to the river, you know? So I can't, I try to figure out something that we can do and I know they're underfunded, blah, blah, blah. So that's just a general comment that I see after living out here for as many years as I have. Yeah. Please. And plus I loved your dad's editorials. He was awesome. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> that's hilarious, thank you. He, did, he didn't mince words, did he? No. <laughs> um, we've tried with state parks too. We were on a call with um, with Mita Friedman from the regional parks and um, state parks, and they did a lot of explaining of why they can't, they can't, they can't. So um, yeah. we will we will keep on them. But um, you know, the trash is the big issue, and the and the um, porta potties or whatever. They have their restrooms open, I guess, but the trash is the big issue. So. Yeah, we'll keep at them, but I um, I can't make any promises right now. Thank you. We'll try. We'll keep Thank trying. Uh, Liz, do you have any comments or questions? Um, I think Brooks covered the one I was concerned about was the uh, shuttle of getting people out and, and having a few less cars on the road. Mm -hmm. And then I was just thinking maybe if, you know, people, people were also um, maybe did more advertising about being on the coast on the off season, yeah. you know, if they, you know, they could come out now when it's nice and windy and, and maybe <laughs> not want to come back, I don't know. But um, I think once they, um, you know, once they get out, I think everybody's gotten a taste of, you know, some kind of freedom, you know, the biggest freedom, you know, and you hate to, you know, have people, you know, tell people, oh, you can't come out here because I live here or something and you're bugging me or whatever, but I love to do that. But, but you know, it'd be nice if we could, Kind of stagger it somehow, you know. If, if there were more incentives to come out, you know, I mean, I don't know exactly where you could go with this as far as, you know, I could see maybe people have certain vacations they want to come out during the summer, but I mean, the fall and things are beautiful also. But um, you know, the winter can be fun if they stay, you know, off off the beaches. But um, you know, I think if we just see if there's some kind of control of all this, you know, you know, group of people you know, um, converging on us all together, so. Yeah, you're a hundred percent right. And our, um, our, our mandate, and rightfully so, is to promote Sonoma County November through April. We have had so many starts and stops with fires and everything that we had to kind of generate that we're off our, off our track. 
So once we get back on the track, it will be the um, November through April is when we're going to really invite people to come to Sonoma County. There's a lot to do. There's a lot of reasons to be here during that time. Then April through the summer is going to be responsible travel. That's going to be our key. And then when we move into the fall, um, it's going to we're going to have to watch out for our wildfire season. So you know we're yeah. we really have to plan on some of these things that we know we're going to be uh, annual basis, but the that November through April time period is is you're hundred percent right on that. That is uh, going to be our our key time. So, okay. uh, but Thank but you. during this time when we know people are going to come, we're going to you know really encourage responsible whiskey. But um, and the shuttle's a great idea. Well, we can see how we can work on that too. Yeah, maybe Sonoma <laughs> Transit. Um, yeah. Hey, moving on. Um, Jay, did you have any? question or comment? I did not. And um, thank you. And uh, Marty, did you want to chime in? Um, no, I appreciate the presentations, um, which are telling me more about what exists, but I don't really have anything to add. Thank you. OK, thanks, Paul. Thank you, Scott. Um, Claudia, I, I, I want to thank you for making the distinction of um, tourists versus sort of visitors to the beaches. And, and you know, and I, it's very clear in your presentation that you're trying to promote the restaurants and the hotels and that type of tourism. Um, and, and that's very different than, and probably a lot smaller than just people who come out to the beaches there in Bodega Bay. Um, so uh, I think always, you know, even if the MAC holds on to that distinction, it's going to help us um, understand, you know, what the problems are and the solutions are uh, without destroying business at the same time. Thank you. That's a critical point. Mm -hmm. And that really, when I got here, it was evident that um, the marketing that had been done was so Bay Area out to Sacramento focused that, you, I mean, it doesn't take a marketing genius to figure out that that's weekend travelers. I mean, that's where they come. They come on a Friday, they leave on Sunday. So really our push has been much more in the direct flight markets until COVID hit, but, and we started to see some really good traction, but we'll get back on that as soon as we possibly can. Those people will stay longer and, and use not only the time of year, but make up that midweek and, you know, sort of that other time that's a little softer in the market. So that's a critical point. And, you know, people are going to come out to the coast anyway. And, but those who are really coveted travelers who are going to behave responsibly, going to spend more money, going to, going to respect this, they're going to come from further away. So it's, it's really important that we not spend money, much money on our, on this, this close in feeder market, but that we're, we're reaching further out. Um, and we do that purposefully to get the right kind of traveler. Thank you, Claudia. Okay. Thank you. Abby, you have some comment or question? Um, uh, no, I didn't have anything to add. Um, just thank you for the presentations. Okay, thank you. And Wanda? Um, yeah, I was wondering if um, there's any way that you could be uh, promoting uh, donations to our local VFDs, volunteer fire departments emergency services along the coast? There is a program that's starting to gain traction that's going to do just that. Oh. So I don't really have a lot of detail on it, but you know, certainly uh, that became, you know, that was loud and clear during um, this, this past period that we were all focused on emergency services. So uh, there is a program um, that there's a, a program up in Oregon called the Forever Fund, Forever Oregon, and did that same kind of thing, that crowdsourcing of funding for a particular program. In that case, it was sustainability program. But they we're looking at that same thing. And I, I think that that will get kicked off here for the summer. So Great. still more to come on that, but others are thinking the same thing you are. <clears throat> okay, thank you. And um, uh, along the lines of what Wanda mentioned, um, there's an, a tension between um, bringing more tourists and, and funding um, 
dealing with the tourists that come and especially uh, emergency services yeah. are heavily impacted by uh, visitors. And so there's that, that tension of um, where TOT funds go. And um, that just needs to be put into the mix. Yeah, yeah, there's no, there's no question. Um, and it's uh, that $75,000 that went for the ambulance with the Bodega Bay uh, fire protection was a part of that. But, um, and we're, we want to, I mean, if there's conversation happening around that or, or any way that we can be part of that, please let us know. Cause we, we, we don't want to <laughs> be at arm's length for that conversation. Cause if, if it, there's some way that visitors are impacting our county, we need to be part of this solution. So, um, you know, that's our, that's our commitment. Yeah, I appreciate that. Uh, Linda, did you want to comment at this point? Is Linda there? Um, no, I mean, I think I'll, I'll go when we talk about the fire services um, okay. and the potential funding sources. All right, uh, let's open it up to public comment. Jason, are there any hands raised? We currently don't have any hands raised. We do have, um, we have a, a few questions in the Q&A. Um, I believe Claudia is typing answers to two of them right now. Um, we have one though is, um, and this may be for Sheila, where are past annual reports available? Yes, um, Sonoma edb.org. We've moved away from those traditional ones where we would print them because we made a commitment two years ago to be more sustainable. So no more printed materials, but everything is available in a PDF format. And um, on our landing page on our website, we also have where we track our assistance by district. So in case anyone is un, you know, curious about, well, what do they do and where do they do it? And, and how is that shake out in terms of the staff um, work and um, allocation of you know, staff time. So we also have all of that information on our website as well. And now we do have one hand raised in the gallery. It's uh, Tom and Prudy Tucker. Okay. Tom, go ahead and unmute yourself. Yes. I. I don't know where to start, but uh, first of all, I'd like to thank Linda, Linda Hopkins for the marijuana issue uh, being postponed for another year for review. And I appreciated her uh, mea culpa, you might say, which you don't hear very much anymore. And uh, for Claudia, I'm curious as to the budget for safety uh, with the TOTs versus what is spent for Sonoma Magazine, which I know marketing and I know how expensive it is, and $75,000 for our emergency services is a pittance because one vehicle to transport our injured is a lot more than $75,000. Uh, as far as uh, leaving no trace and uh, protecting our environment, Claudia, thank you for understanding that. But how do you see our short-term vacation rentals compliance with those issues? And uh, I can tell you from observations of a gated fence across from us that has no outside access to a trail to the beach uh, being crawled under, through, and over with no respect. And it really bothers me to watch this happen. Uh, and I'd also like to mention the consolidation of Bodega Bay Fire Department. Uh, I, I really think that they are overburdened They've evacuated two people from my immediate neighborhood, my street, uh, in, in the last month. They've responded to broken limbs on the beach, kayakers that have been blown into shore, 
with their kayaks and hypothermia situations. Yeah, Tom, Fire we'll, we'll be covering some of this uh, in the next segment. Maybe we could- Oh, I could go on and on. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you. All right. Um, we do have, um, Chair, we do have another hand raised. Okay. Um, uh, Alira. Alira, go ahead and unmute yourself. Hi, can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Okay. All right. Um, Lyra Filippini here, Vice President of Waves of Compassion Foundation and ex officio on the board for the Bodega Bay Area Chamber of Commerce. I just want to say thank you to Claudia for being here to answer all these questions. And um, I can attest to that she has been so responsive and helpful. When we do have too many tourists out here, they make sure to stop their ads on Facebook. And when we you know, are in the, in the slow season, she really tries to make sure that we do have um, you know, more, more attention to getting the tourists out here during the period of time that our businesses are you know, really struggling. And from you know, just ongoing multiple years of watching that happen, uh, one of the things that we've come up with as like a possible solution, and I don't know if it could ever be something that Sonoma County Tourism Bureau as a separate contracted um, entity outside of the actual, you know, local government would be able to help with, but something that, you know, like the, the lighted signs on Highway 12 or 101, you know, coming through either Sebastopol or Petaluma to indicate that like, there's 40 minutes to an hour of stopped traffic um, in the summer on the busiest weekends. Something like that might actually be really helpful to um, you know, mitigate how incredibly busy it is out here. Looks like I have an, an unstable internet connection. I hope you guys can hear me. Thank yeah, you very yeah. much. Yeah, the, on that signage question, that's being worked on. Um, Elise has been working with Caltrans successfully, I believe. Great. Uh, Linda has her hand raised. Yeah, actually through the chair, if I might provide an update, I actually was in a meeting earlier today with Elise and Leo and Senator McGuire and a whole host of Caltrans staff, including the fourth district director. Um, and we were talking about this very thing. And so we have identified potential existing sign locations New signs are extraordinarily expensive, so and would also take time in terms of permitting um, and right of way encroachment permits and those kinds of things. So in the short term, we are looking at existing signs along 101. The goal would be to get the county, the regional parks and transportation and public works department, the ability to directly program those signs with messages about coastal and river beaches being full. Um, and so it is something that we are aggressively pursuing. And the next step is to bring regional parks and transportation and public works staff into the contact with the appropriate Caltrans staff to actually work out how a memorandum of agreement for this kind of work could be undertaken. But the goal is to basically co-opt those signs that already exist and use them for exactly this messaging um, to let folks know during peak seasons that the beaches are full, the parking lots are full. So we'll come up with some standard uh, stock messages and be able to update that in real time. Hopefully we're still working our way through the Caltrans process, but we're, we're making good progress. And Elise has been tireless on this issue, yeah. working with staff as well. Yeah, it's, it's, it's uh, real promising. Uh, Jason, is, is that, are there hands raised still or are we able to- We move? do not have any questions on Facebook or any um, hands raised in the gallery. Okay, Claudia and Sheba, I wanna thank you both for coming and spending this time with us. It's been very informative and I, I look forward to um, working on solutions uh, with you, Claudia, on uh, some of the things you suggested about um, uh, funding, finding other funding campaigns uh, and, uh, would be very interesting to follow up with you on. Um, thank you. You're welcome to stay and you're welcome to um, finish your evening with your families. I'm staying. Okay. I'm going to hear the rest of this. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> thank, thank you so much for having us. Yeah.
you. Absolutely. Thank you. So moving on, uh, fire department consolidation, uh, Mark Bramfit from LAFCO, Local Agency Formation Commission, uh, will speak to this. And I, I, I believe Linda will uh, join in as well. Uh, so uh, Mark, the floor is yours. Thank you, Chair Farmer and members of the council. Real pleasure to be with you this evening. Um, I tend to go blisteringly fast, but try to be succinct and leave time for you to direct me with questions. Um, I intend to give you the briefest of introductions to LAFCO so you understand what LAFCO is. And then I wanna talk about Bodega Bay Fire Protection District and Fort Ross. Um, there are other things that we could talk about, but I think that's primarily what I was asked to review with you. Um, the, uh, every state, uh, every county in the state has a LAFCO, a local agency formation commission. Um, ours is made up of six elected officials. That's two county supervisors, two city council members, two board members from special districts. And we also have a public member. Um, we are fully independent. We are authorized under state law. Interestingly, we are not overseen by the state. Um, some people would have the mis impression that we are a county agency. Um, we do contract with the county for services. Unlike Sheba, who has a, an immense staff of 14 people, um, LAFCO has a staff, an authorized staff of four. We've been operating on three and one person is leaving in two weeks. So I'm a little frazzled. I apologize for that. Um, what does LAFCO do? Well, despite the name saying it's a local agency formation commission, we rarely, if ever, form new agencies or incorporate new cities. Um, since the incorporation of the town of Windsor, which was in the last decade, the only um, agency that we have formed is North Sonoma Coast Fire Protection District. So hi, Marty. Marty is on the board of that district. That's the only district, only local agency that we have formed in this century. Um, the other kinds of activities we do, occasionally we do dissolutions of districts that are either not functioning or not providing adequate services or for whatever reason uh, need to be shut down. The best example, I would we've done three of those in my tenure the last six years. Um, the one that you might be aware of was the dissolution of the Palm Drive Healthcare District. Um, sort of our bread and butter is annexations. Oftentimes these are single parcels or small groups of parcels that are being annexed into a city or special district. Um, we do those sort of bread and butter, but um, they're not very controversial. The only one that you might've heard of was uh, the annexation of the Roseland community into the city of Santa Rosa, which happened after 20 years of discussion, but I'm happy to have had it actually happen under my watch uh, a couple of years ago. Um, what we spend a lot of our time on, and I spend a, a lot of my time on, is reorganizations. Um, and that is, you know, should we meld um, local agencies together um, so that they provide more effective and efficient services to their community, which is sort of the overarching charter for LAFCO is to try and ensure that our local agencies are providing effective and efficient services. I'm gonna bring up an example. It's not directly under the coastal area, um, but it's one that I think we're pretty proud of and represents the kind of win-win that everyone would really like to see. Um, as of two weeks ago, the Forestville Fire Protection District was dissolved and then subsequently annexed into the Sonoma County Fire District. Um, the Forestville board wanted to do this as did the board at Sonoma County Fire. Um, I think it's a win-win. Um, the residents in Forestville are gonna see a slightly higher parcel tax. It goes typically from $115 a year to $162.50. So some people were not happy about seeing their taxes go up. That taxation, however, is really undergirding um, the continued provision of services in Forestville. Um, Sonoma County Fire brings superior leadership, administration and management skills to the table. The employees of Forestville are now part of a larger agency, so they have more options for um, promotion. And then um, lastly, and this is crucial, this is I think the really key win for the folks in Forestville. Um, Sonoma County Fire intends to staff the engine that comes out of Forestville, the fire station in Forestville, 
with um, a paramedic. So in the past, Forestville was only providing EMT service, um, emergency medical technicians. They're great. They offer superior sort of first aid service, but now the residents of Forestville have um, a paramedic on the engine, um, whereas before they were waiting for an ambulance to come out of, of Guerneville. So um, improved service really, I think, in general, a win-win, and those are the kinds of things um, we're working for. So um, what I now want to do is talk about the more challenging situations that we do have within the territory that you're representing. So I'm going to start with Bodega Bay, and then I'm going to talk about Fort Ross. Um, Bodega Bay fire, um, one of the things that LAFCO does is sort of study districts, and we did a study of all of the fire and emergency medical service agencies in West County, um, a pretty long and ex exhaustive study. And I would urge you to hit our website and, and review that and check on the agency that serves you directly and see what it says. Um, in that process, um, we, we did determine that Bodega Bay faces sort of some fundamental um, financial challenges. Despite having one of the highest parcel taxes, certainly the highest parcel tax in Sonoma County, if not the highest parcel tax in the state, the residents of Bodega Bay are paying $524 a year in parcel taxes. Um, Bodega Bay is hugely challenged by tourism impacts and you've discussed that um, in just the two prior presentations. Um, the issue for Bodega Bay is they really don't have enough money to provide the level of service that the community warrants, especially with that tourist impact. Um, and now um, the district is really challenged and has lost some redundancy within the department. Um, just imagine this, I'm gonna be very brief about this and, and um, Deputy Chief Hertzberg is on the phone from Bodega Bay and he can explain it further. Um, the challenge for Bodega Bay is they have an ambulance, somebody breaks their leg on the beach, they pick them up. It takes a 45 minute drive to Santa Rosa to get to a hospital, some time to get that patient admitted and 45 minutes back, you just need a secondary crew, um, whether it's, it doesn't have an ambulance, but at least you have a paramedic on an engine who can deal with the next potential victim that happens in that window. And that's really necessary. And they're losing that backup capability. Um, we did as part of the municipal service review process, sort of paint a roadmap where Bodega Bay would be incorporated with the Sonoma County Fire. Sonoma County Fire took over Russian River. So they're now running the ambulance out of Guerneville. Um, they were willing to take Bodega Bay as well, if and only if a funding mechanism could somehow be arranged. So, so uh, LAFCO approved the reorganization. They said, yes, Bodega Bay should go into Sonoma County Fire. They approved it with a condition that a, a suitable financial agreement could be reached. It, at the time, it appeared imminent that the county might be able to come up with a funding arrangement that would support Bodega Bay. Um, so the commission approved it, and then we went through what we call a protest proceeding, which is we allow the residents of Bodega Bay to say, no commission timeout, this was the wrong decision. So they could either, if, if there was enough protest, they could vacate the commission's decision, or if there was some protest, we would actually go to a, a vote of the residents in the district. Um, there was very little protest. So the citizens of Bodega Bay Fire Protection District thought that this was a good idea. Unfortunately, the financial agreement did not come to pass. So the reorganization was canceled. The commission again conditioned approval on appropriate financing and that didn't happen. Um, I will come back to that at the very end about what's happening around financing. I know um, Supervisor Hopkins has probably way more information than I do. And by the way, Supervisor Hopkins does serve on LAFCO. So she has perspective from both the county and from LAFCO. Let me briefly talk about Fort Ross. Fort Ross is a volunteer fire company. They're actually serving a portion of a district that falls under the county. Um, all of the volunteer fire companies are really part, are, are serving almost as contractors for an area that the county owns for fire protection service. Um, Chief Genassi, I know he's on the phone. 
Um, Chief is desperately trying to retire. Um, he calls me every once in a while and says, Mark, please help us. Um, Fort Ross, as many of the volunteer fire companies, as well as many of our districts, relies on volunteers exclusively. And that is becoming increasingly difficult. Um, it's not just that people are getting older, um, but that is true. Um, just the number of people who are willing to do the work to be a volunteer firefighter, um, the amount of training that you have to do, that is just in steep decline across the county. It's affecting not just the volunteer fire companies, but again, many of our fire protection districts do not rely on paid people. They rely almost exclusively on volunteers. That is becoming untenable and it's becoming untenable in Fort Ross. Now, I think we have a general roadmap, at least I have a general roadmap in my head that says the upper portion of Fort Ross can be served by Timber Cove. I have some concerns about the ongoing viability of Timber Cove. They're doing a great job, but I think they're gonna face these same challenges down the road and I don't know what the solution is for them. Um, the lower portion, needs to go with Casadero or maybe Casadero and Monterio needs to be folded into Sonoma County Fire. Mm -hmm. um, these questions about where these reorganizations ought to happen, you can imagine are fraught with a lot of concern from the districts and from the volunteer fire companies. I don't like to call it political, but it is. Um, these agencies are often the heart of their community. The firehouse is the effective city hall, and I appreciate that, but I think we all need to come to some um, solutions that will enable these services to continue. Um, I said I would come back to the um, funding issue. I've been in contact quite a bit with the county over the last three weeks, literally. Um, they are trying to prepare a roadmap around financing for the, for the volunteer fire company territories, including Fort Ross, figuring out how we can, how they can provide enough funding so that some of the districts can take over these territories. So I'm pleased that that um, impetus, which I think had kind of stalled, appears to be moving um, forward a little bit more. Um, there's discussions around using TOT money to try and um, supplement some of these situations. I will say that the county is not just looking at the areas that they're responsible for, which we call County Service Area 40. Those are some of these volunteer companies. They are also very much looking for a, a solution for Bodega Bay. Um, LAFCO's role is interesting in that we're supposed to figure out the roadmap of where the best fits are. So we absolutely need to see the financing come together, but um, we're really supposed to balance the service needs of communities and the best agencies that are able to do that. And what the commission is facing now, um, we did a lot of reorganizations. We went from well over 40 organizations that are providing fire and EMS service in the county, over 40. Um, we're now in the low 30s. There's some sense we need outside of the cities to get down to five or six and many counties in the state have gone down to one. So you're either in the city getting city service or you're getting service from one agency in the unincorporated areas. Um, we're working towards that vision, but what's happened now, I think is we've done some of the easy ones and now there's a lot of conflict about which agencies want which territories. And the commission's really wrestling with that. And um, the way that they've responded is to form an ad hoc committee of three members to try and um, wrestle this to the ground. I've certainly been working on it for the six years that I've been with LAFCO. It's very, very challenging at this point. There are a lot of competing visions about what the roadmap ought to look like. And that's just proving really challenging. Um, my staff, my, my big, big staff um, tells me to be proud of what we have accomplished over the last few years. We have found homes for some volunteer companies. We've seen some really good positive consolidations like the Forestville example I shared with you at the beginning. Um, they like to look at that and say, we should be proud. I'm not a pessimist, but I'm looking for how can we overcome the challenges to, to move this down the road even further and really ensure that there's effective and efficient 
fire and emergency medical services for the communities that we all live in. I'm going to time out on that and take a drink of water. And I'm happy to answer questions and address anything else that you think is in LACO's purview. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I was hoping you might speak more to Timber Cove. You touched briefly on it. Um, uh, sure. Take a moment. Um, first of all, wonderful agency at Timber Cove. They, they do a phenomenal job. What happens in these very rural areas like Timber Cove, um, their calls tend to be a little different than elsewhere in the county. Um, most people don't recognize this, but well in excess of 75% of calls to fire agencies um, involve at least medical issues. So, you know, you have a car crash, you take the jaws of life to get the people out of the car crash, then they become a medical issue and you need to, you know, have a good medic or hopefully a paramedic on the engine to save the person's life. Um, Timber Cove, it's a lot more of car crashes and downed trees, um, outstanding organization but it's volunteers and their average age. I, I'm not quoting this exactly, but it's well over 60. And, you know, these folks are a little less willing to get up in the middle of the night for a down tree or a car crash on Highway 1 and less able to do that and less able to do the 200 hours of training that they nominally need to do every year to be a volunteer. Uh, my real concern about Timber Cove, they're doing fine right now. I, I just, I want to really be clear, they're doing fine right now. If, however, it really starts aging out and their volunteer ranks decline, we don't have an obvious solution um, for, for providing service there. If the same situation happens in Casadero, you can do a contract with Cal Fire that has a station right down the street from the Casadero station. There's no Cal Fire station in the Timber Cove area. There's no obvious way to do a, a paid staff solution in Timber Cove. So that really concerns me. Now, I've had a, a lot of conversations with um, Northern Sonoma Coast, uh, uh, North Sonoma Coast Fire, which is Sea Ranch in Annapolis, and saying, you know, can you help? But the distances and the remoteness of these territories is really challenging. So I cross my fingers and say Timber Cove's doing great. Um, I, I'm worried more about the long-term future and, and how Timber Cove um, manages to serve the needs of their community. Okay, thank you. Um, Linda, did you wanna speak at this time? On... Yeah, I was actually um, hoping to pass the microphone over to Assistant Chief Hertzberg to review a little bit about what's happening in um, the Dega Bay with the fiscal crisis and the ongoing work with the county and then I'll chime in after his presentation if that's okay through the chair. Okay, we can do that. Um, that's fine. I had him in a different spot. That's good. It's a good time. Um, Chief Hertz. Um, there you go. You know, great opportunity for us to speak to our community and, and that community is defined in different ways. We are a fire district with 27 square miles, um, but our ambulance service zone is 211 square miles. And it actually touches many of you who are on this MAC and represented by this MAC. Um, so it's a really good time for us to sort of explain where we are and where we are hoping to be. Uh, it's also very nice to serve with Director Bramfit and Supervisor Hopkins. I am a commissioner on LAFCO with both of them. I think we share that same value set of trying to figure out what is the very best service model um, for this beautiful but dangerous coast. I don't think it's any secret and people have been talking about it. We are a fire district in crisis. Uh, the crisis is essentially a fiscal crisis, but the way it's manifested is that it is affecting our ability to serve this 211 square mile area. Um, since March, we've lost two paramedics. Our normal staffing should be greater than it was when we started losing people. Essentially, the way we look at staffing is we look at the number of people on our engine and the number of people on our ambulance. An ambulance must be staffed by two people, obviously, right? Someone's gotta be driving it, someone's gotta be in back taking care of the patient. We are advanced life support paramedic. We are fully staffed 24 seven um, paid district supplemented by our volunteers. The proper staffing levels for a rural community, um, the safety standards set by NFPA is um, normally four 
people on the engine and two people on the ambulance. That's because in rural areas, we've got greater challenges and longer distances to travel. Um, in our best of times, uh, the last couple of years, we were two people on the engine and two on the ambulance, and we were making that do. We are currently staffed now with one person on the engine, one captain on the engine, and two people on the ambulance. That is below minimum safety standards. Uh, it is putting not only the community we serve at risk, but putting the people who work here at risk. Um, this has happened because in this current fiscal crisis, um, we cannot offer people long-term career jobs. Uh, we're in a very, very competitive market for paramedic firefighters. It's competitive nationally. Locally, we're competing with people who pay 30 to 40% more than we pay. Um, we demand a, a, a skill set that is unique to the coast. And we have not had one qualified applicant apply since March when we posted the two job openings when the two, two of our paramedics left. Um, we are doing our very best to serve this community. Um, the chief is running calls. We're moving people around. Uh, you talked, uh, Mark, about the, the aging out of Timber Cove. The two people covering the station at night as volunteers are both in their 70s. We're both EMTs, and we're trying to be that fourth person on duty prepared for a second call. Um, recently, and this is not even, well, first of all, there's no such thing as tourist season out here anymore. I think we all recognize that. Um, it is tourist season every day. Some weekends are like the 4th of July. Um, we are getting doubled on calls and tripled on calls, and we simply don't have the staff to run those calls. So what is the hope? What is the salvation? Well, the hope and salvation is to finish and finalize our consolidation with the Sonoma County Fire District. Um, you know, Director Brampett explained that. Um, we no longer have a sphere of influence. That's a technical term. We are now a part of the sphere of influence of Sonoma County Fire District. It was a great move to improve service, uh, in part because their ambulance and our ambulance are the advanced life support ambulances um, in West County. And with Supervisor Hopkins' support and encouragement, we've moved toward consolidation in that area. So where are we today? Well, we are really concerned about the safety of the community and, and, and concerned, I am very concerned as the Assistant Chief about the safety of our staff. Um, some of them are gonna speak today, but we've, we've got some, what I think are promising developments. First of all, we're getting incredible support from the community. And when I say the community, it's not just Bodega Bay. Our, our friends and neighbors who live here have been very supportive. I think one of the things that we're turning the tide on, and it's something that Supervisor Hopkins has stressed, is that there are tremendous impacts from within the county and outside the county into West County. And I think that we have really changed the dialogue in a way so that people are seeing Bodega Bay Fire as a county resource as opposed to simply a West County or a Bodega Bay resource. And I think that's been an important part of the narrative. Um, we are now hearing um, you know, supervisors and others say, yes, I do visit the coast and I want my family to be safe when I'm out on the coast. One of the challenges that Supervisor Hopkins has had is that she represents a large rural area and she needs three or four votes to move things along. Um, and it's often difficult to get those votes by people who feel that they have no skin in the game or no interest um, in the in the count in Bodega Bay. And I think we're, we're changing that right now. So where are we? Um, it's been a really rocky roller coaster ride. I mean, there's no doubt about that. Um, if you had asked me where we were a week ago, it'd be very different from where I think we are today, because this morning we had what I think is a very productive meeting. Um, chief Hind, who will be the chief of our annexing agency and was going to appear tonight, but um, had a conflict come up at the last minute of family conflict and could not be here. Uh, chief Hind and I met with Supervisors Rabbit and Hopkins, and we met with the county administrator and the county administrator's financial analyst. And we are working on two sets of plans. Um, there is a global plan. When we talk about the needs of Bodega Bay, we are not the only fire EMS agency that is in need. All of the fire EMS agencies in this county have needs. All the volunteer companies have needs. Um, and we recognize that. But we are the only one that is going over a cliff right now. We are the only ones losing staff paid personnel. Uh, we are. And we are being relied upon by some of those very agencies that also have needs. Our ambulance service goes from Bloomfield pretty much up to parts of Monterio, up to Jenner. 
Um, in a bad day when there are no other ambulances around, you'll see us go all the way up to Sea Ranch. So we are trying to cover this area understaffed and we're doing, I think, a, a pretty good job with it. The meeting this morning identified the global needs. We've all known they exist and we're looking toward a global situation so that no fire agency, no matter where they are in the county, has needs, that all of us are strong and robust and sustainable. But in terms of Bidega Bay, Bay, in order for us to be able to hire, the problem we have, the reason no one's applying for our jobs is we simply cannot say to people, your job is secure, you have a career opportunity. So if we want these highly skilled paramedic firefighters um, to come to us instead of going to Sonoma County Fire or Santa Rosa Fire or Petaluma and the places with whom we're competing, we have to be able to say to them, you have a job next year. And we can't say that right now. So this morning, um, we started unveiling a plan that would be perhaps a step plan with the end goal of finalizing our consolidation with Sonoma County Fire. And we're working on those details. And that may involve something like a joint powers agreement, which allows us to informally, um, well, in a sense, formally merge without the full consolidation. We won't get all the benefits of consolidation. For example, the parcel tax that is paid in Bodega Bay will remain at 524. It will not be dropped to the 184. Uh, we will not add the fifth position that NFPA demands that we have. But what we will do is stabilize our current workforce. We will get them competitive salaries and we will be able to hire because at the end of this, if we can make this work, we can say by date X, you're going to be a part of Sonoma County Fire as we all are. Again, this is, we talk about the financial crisis, but really what this is, is a service crisis from our perspective. We are wired to take care of people. And we need to know that we have the staff and the resources needed to do this on a long-term basis. You're, you're going to hear from Chief Brunel, you may hear from one or two of our board members about the difficulties we're facing. And, and really, when we say we're in crisis and we're going off the cliff, they're going to explain that to you. We, we are being threatened. Our very existence right now is being threatened. We are one serious injury away from not being able to serve. Uh, we are one serious, we are one person finding a better job. Um, and better in the sense, not that they don't love working for us. When people are leaving us, um, they're coming very, very sad and saying, look, um, I, I've got a family. I want to buy a house or I'm going to get married and I want to have a kid. And I can make 40% more and have a long-term career job in Santa Rosa. And I've got to leave. So I do think um, on the upside, and I'll let Supervisor Hopkins talk about it. We made some progress this morning. I think we've defined the issue clearly. I think we see the end goal clearly. It's going to take some work. Um, she needs the support of other supervisors. And for those of us in the community and all of you who've been out working to get her that support that she needs to, to get these resources out to West County, we're deeply appreciative. You know, I'd like Supervisor Hopkins to speak. And of course, I'm here to answer questions. Um, I do want to leave you in this with the, the one sense of security that we are making it work. Um, you know, it, is been, it has been very difficult. Uh, we have, you know, fortune has shined on some of our calls, quite honestly, when we've been under-resourced. Um, we've had calls that could have been far more serious than they were, and we've been able to handle them. But with that, I will tell you that after this morning, um, you know, I'm smiling a lot more than I was the last few weeks. And thank you, Supervisor Hopkins, for leading that meeting. So I, I guess I'll turn over the microphone, but I'm available for comment questions if someone has any. And I do, I do want you to look forward to, we've got some people, some of the staff, and board members and the chief do want to speak. Thank you, Linda. Thank you so much. Um, so I want to provide a little bit of detail and I have some information not only for Bodega Bay, um, but also for other uh, sort of fire areas along the um, entire coastline as well as the lower Russian River. So I've been working really hard and I, it's not quite ready uh, for prime time yet. But we do have a phased approach, not only to funding Bodega Bay, but also other West County fire agencies. Um, I thought that the first agenda item was going to be on consent next week. It actually um, didn't quite make it in time for next week's board meeting, but it will be on the next board meeting. And that is an extension of service contracts um, with a variety of agencies, including Bodega Bay, that will provide $500,000 a year to Bodega Bay for two years. Um, it will also provide additional funding to Gold Ridge Fire District, um, as well as Northern Sonoma County Fire District, and um, also Cloverdale. 
So that is just the first phase, but the um, next phase is that we also are requesting, I put in a board budget request for Bodega Bay Fire Protection District specifically during our budget hearings, which are in mid-June. Um, so we'll be seeking a two-year additional lifeline because the 500,000 is not adequate to meet their needs. Um, that will provide the additional staffing and um, provides an additional 24 seven paramedic coverage for you know, $500,000 per year, but there's additional ongoing structural deficits that need to be addressed. And we also need to come into pay parity to ensure that they have the ability to hire personnel. Um, so that sort of second lifeline will be deliberated during budget hearings, and that will hopefully be coming forward as the recommendation of the fire services ad hoc comprised of myself and supervisor rabbit. Then in July, we plan to bring before the board of supervisors, it's either July 11th or 13th, it's mid July, which I think is actually the first uh, meeting after budget hearings because we go dark for a little bit. Um, we'll be, be bringing a holistic approach that will provide funding for multiple um, fire districts that are in need. And it will also hopefully find permanent homes for the CSA 40 companies. The goal here is really to support LAFCO's effort because um, there's, a, there's a challenge, right? Where in LAFCO holds the power to bring districts together. And yet we know that some of these districts are struggling. And so without additional funding, they will not be able to complete those consolidations. And um, just so everyone knows, it's actually technically not within the county's legal responsibilities to provide additional funding for um, failing fire districts. We are responsible for CSA 40s, which are dependent districts that are dependent on the county of Sonoma. That is our only legal responsibility. But I think that everyone acknowledges, um, and I've, I've really thrown myself into this work, that there is a huge moral imperative for the county to ensure that our fire services remain viable and remain strong. So I will continue to fight for additional funding for our fire services, um, including Bodega Bay and other coastal areas that are in need. So that's kind of the update is that we have sort of three different paths and um, there is the, you know, $500,000, which will be coming very, very soon on consent that which means it's pretty much guaranteed right people don't vote no on consent items they have the blessing of a full board that's why they're on consent. Um, then we will have budget deliberations, specifically for a lifeline for Bodega Bay is part of that deliberation and request. And then in July, we'll be looking at more of a countywide strategy. Um, the countywide strategy doesn't provide absolutely everything. So a portion of that um, long-term solution will be a future fire sales tax initiative that will go to the voters in June of 2022. And we're hoping that we'll get support um, from the business community, from the tourism community to provide that ongoing support that was so desperately needed in many of our unincorporated and also urban areas. Um, so that will be sort of something that I, I hope that we're able to bring before the MAC to provide additional updates later on. And um, we will be also working very closely with LAFCO from the county side to look at LAFCO's recommendations for where the agencies should wind up so that we are able to strategically provide the financial support to complete those consolidations and annexations. And with that, I would hand it back to you, Chair Farmer. Thank you. Um, I'd like to give an opportunity to um, some of our local chiefs or their representatives to speak for three minutes, um, or uh, if they can, because we're tied on time. Um, Josh Ferrucci is, is, are you on from Bodega? Is, is he in the panel, jo um, Jason? I'm not, I'm not seeing him in the um, gallery. Okay. Um, Scott, Ron might be if Josh isn't. Is Ron Albini present? I do see a JSP. I don't know if Josh's middle initial is S, but there is a JSP in the participants. Well, we can come back around. Um, and Jay, we can, um, uh, you and I can talk during the council time. Uh, uh, Steve Genesi from Fort Ross, is, is he available uh, in the gallery? I'm here. Uh, there we go. Okay, uh, Mark, uh, just an update. Um, I have uh, retired and uh, Steve Shane is the new chief, but I've agreed uh, maybe foolishly to uh, stay on and uh, uh, work with the uh, consolidation process. But I have been asked to, uh, you know, state the uh, Fort Ross uh, 
position on uh, consolidation. And that is, we recognize uh, the need and fully support uh, consolidation with our current fire services uh, neighbors. Our consolidation efforts have taken several turns through the years. At one time, we thought that the uh, north part of uh, Fort Ross would go to Timber Cove and the south part uh, would go to Casadero. Uh, after much thought and discussion, it was recognized that a very cohesive community should not be split, but should consolidate as a complete unit uh, with other departments that would uh, best serve our community's needs. Any consolidation must recognize and support the need for a strong cadre of volunteers without which response times would be excessive. Call volume in the Casadero Fort Ross area does not justify uh, paid personnel and response times from stations with paid firefighters would be excessive. Therefore, the need for a strong uh, volunteer component, which we currently uh, continue to support, including um, seven uh, EMTs at Fort Ross and soon to be uh, eight. So we, without reservation, support consolidation to improve service to our community and satisfy Sonoma County's desire for fewer number of departments in the, uh, in the county. Consolidation with Casadero as a first step to further consolidation with other departments is one option. Uh, it may be appropriate to create a district that extends from the Sonoma coast inland to Fort Ross, Casadero and other departments all the way to Gold Ridge. The most important consideration in any consolidation should be maintaining strong volunteer cadres to supplement any paid firefighters that respond into our area. No consolidation should increase response times or reduce the number of available firefighters. Um, as some of you know, our, an accident on our roads requires people for traffic control. It requires people to take patient care, uh, land helicopters, uh, it can't be done with uh, two people that respond from a, uh, a paid uh, department uh, miles and miles away. So we look to uh, Alafco to uh, help us with this process and uh, make the, uh, the right decision with the uh, right um, departments as our uh, associates. Thanks much. Thank Hopefully. you. Um, Bonnie Plecos from North Coast, I believe, is on a call and unable to uh, speak. Um, and Timber Cove was unable to attend. And I'll, I'll speak to that when my turn comes around. We had Mark Hine, but I understand he's got a family emergency. Is that correct? And so, Steve, you said so. Yeah. So, um, that's the, the people we invited at this point. So I'd like to turn. We've got Chief Grinnell from Bodega Bay. Okay. Um, okay, three, three minutes. <laughs> and, and we've got Captain Storzinger from Bodega uh, Bay. Um, could we defer to the public period for that so we can move on? That would be helpful. Um, and so, uh, Let's, let's go to the council members um, for comments. Unless Linda, you have something you wanted to add at this point. No, okay. So um, uh, let's, um, Kathy, do you have a? Um, uh, I actually, I'm a little more hopeful than I was earlier today. Okay. And uh, I applaud Supervisor Hopkins and Steve Hertzberg and Mark and Sean Grinnell and everybody for trying to help us get out of this horrible situation that we're in. And for thinking out of the box, I appreciate it. So hopefully we can get this situation taken care of so we can still offer our excellent service that we have always been able to offer not only our local community, but the visitors to our coast. Okay. Thank you. Uh, Brooks. Yeah, I, I echo what Kathy said. Our whole community, 
Bodega Bay community um, is very devastated by the situation that our fire department has been put in and, and we are willing and able to do anything to help them. And um, so anyway, we're, we're certainly very, very supportive and we appreciate um, the work that they did this morning and we will be um, praying that everything falls into place as it goes down the line in this three-tiered process. Thank okay, you. thank you. Um, Jay, um, you, did you wanna speak uh, in lieu of uh, Josh? Um, uh, I, I don't have anything from Josh or, or Ron, but I, I did wanna ask a question, um, which is now that we're seeing some of these Wildland Firefighter 2 volunteers that are getting trained, uh, we have like a handful of them in the day already through Fire Forward, Good Fire, is, are they able to be used? I mean, I know they're not medically trained, but are they able to be used on the engines at all? As a quick response. Um, maybe uh, Steve, Steve, maybe you could answer that. You know, I think, I think Chief Brunel is a better person to answer. And I think what we really have to talk about is, is the level of training and the integration of the training also, and actually what they've been trained for and how they fit into our teams. But I'll let Sean answer that. And, and I do wanna go back to something that Mark Brant had said that we tend to think of fire as fire. We are predominantly an EMS agency. Um, the, predominantly, those are the calls that we get. Uh, and so we need, we basically, we need a paramedic ambulance in this area. And those are not roles that they can fulfill. And even though we have strong volunteer responses from, from some of our neighbors, um, some of the stuff we do is technically different and we have to train together to do it. For example, um, you know, we do a lot of rope rescue on the cliffs. We have specific systems that we set up and, and there's a comfort safety level from knowing that we've trained together over and over again so that these skills, we call them perishable skills, don't perish and we keep each other safe. So I'll, as, as terms of whether <clears throat> volunteers can do. Um, we have not integrated them into our plan yet, and I'm not sure that we are going to. That's, I don't think, the role that they're supposed to be fulfilling, but that's Chief's area, not mine. So if you can, Chief, take that and do that. Yes. Let me turn mine off first, and then you can turn your sound on. All right. All right. What he said. Okay. So are you going to speak to Jay's question? Or I think uh, just backing up what Steve was saying that it might they might not be the most appropriate volunteers. Okay. So um, thumbs up there. Uh, all right. Sure. Thank you. Um, <laughs> So, uh, Wanda. Yes, um, I, I would just um, ask that um, LAFCO and the powers that be really have an open mind and, and listen to what's being said at Fort Ross. I represent Fort Ross, for those of you who don't know. And um, you know, there's just a, a, a natural cohesion in our volunteer fire departments out here. Um, the way they've been working together. And um, our Fort Ross um, department has actually been covering in Casadero, you know, in recent months. Over the past how many years we've had these horrible fires and particularly, you know, last year when we, you know, were surrounded by fire, you really saw how this community has come together. And um, it's, um, it's a very unique community. And that's why we feel so strong about <clears throat> Fort Ross VFD not being broken up um, there's there's a long history here, and um, so I just again respectfully ask that um, there's an open-mindedness to what's being suggested by you know on the grassroots level because it really works. They've already responded to I mean this whole area to four fires um, you know this season. <laughs> okay, thank you very much. Okay, thank you, Liz. Well, well, um, we're in a unique situation in Jenner. Uh, by the fact that we're not covered at all, basically. 
We don't have any volunteers here like the good old days when I started here 38 years ago. And um, so, you know, luckily we haven't had any super disasters. I mean, they've had the helicopters come out quite often. I don't know what else comes with that, you know, as far, I mean, they all come from Monterio and um, yeah, Russian River uh, fire. So that's about it. So I, I did get to utilize the services for my first time after 38 years here last year or 37 years last year. Um, but other than that, um, luckily we don't have anything personally for our individual people out here. Um, but it does seem to be that it's a lot of the visitors. A lot more, I've noticed a lot more activity from the helicopters coming out and um, uh, emergency services for the visitors, it seems like. So not really sure what to do about that. And um, I'm not, you know, it would be nice to know what um, what is happening in a way personally, you know, to find out what are their accidents, you know, are they, um, you know, is it from speeding? There's a lot of speeding that happens on the highway, uh, reckless driving, um, hate to say it, but a lot of the motorcyclists are, are quite crazy. And if anybody ever gets a chance, I think you ought to peruse all the um, car commercials. That's awful. Mercedes driving through, thundering through a little neighborhood with kids on the sidewalk, you know, and I mean, you know, and I think they're promoting a lot of fast driving and they show the, our, um, you know, area up here, you know, Highway 1 coming down. But anyway, there's, um, as far as our, you know, sort of protection from fire, we're just always on high alert and just ready to evacuate and possibly lose everything. So mm. other than that, it'd be nice to have something, but, you know, kind of stuck in, in the middle, I guess, on all these departments. So not much else. I don't know what else we can do about it, so. Yeah, I think you're covered by Monterio. Um, yeah, Monterio, Russian Thank Republic. you. Um, Abby, did you wanna comment? Um, I don't, not at this time, I don't have any input. Okay, um, Marty? Yeah, um, I'm disappointed that Bonnie can't join us. Bonnie Plagos is our chief and she's on, she's also an EMT and she's on ambulance duty today and is out of cell range right now. Um, we are up here on the north end. We've been a fire district for about five years and we're scheduled for uh, uh, a visit from, from Mark uh, in the fall, I believe, uh, to um, go through um, everything that we're doing and um, form an opinion about our role in uh, this whole thing. Uh, for those of you who don't know, uh, North Sonoma Coast uh, Fire Protection District is on really on the border between Sonoma and Mendocino counties. Uh, the ambulance district that serves our area is a bi-county ambulance district that covers um, both Mendocino, Southern Mendocino County and Northern Sonoma County. So it has a very large district and that was set up, oh, about 40 years ago uh, through an act of the legislature uh, because it's uh, a bi-county arrangement. So um, that's about it. And we're all volunteer. We don't have any paid uh, firefighters, but we do have a contract with CAL FIRE, which has a station on the Sea Ranch. So it's, uh, you know, incorporated in the same area. Okay, thank you. Paul. I just wanted to um, add a few comments to what Marty was describing about North Sonoma Coast Fire. Um, yeah, we do respond with CAL FIRE. I noticed there was a, Q, there was a, a question in Q&A or a comment um, regarding uh, why can't some of these districts do something like Sea Ranch does, and it's actually North Sonoma Coast, uh, and, and have CAL FIRE also as 
uh, responding as one big unit, North Sonoma Coast. Um, it's very expensive. It's a million dollars a year to have two firefighters, uh, 24, two Cal Fire firefighters, um, 24 seven. Um, and it, it also includes other things in that contract, but it, it's not cheap. <laughs> And uh, even with our, you know, and, and Linda's very aware of this issue also, even with our tax dollars, uh, the money that's designated towards fire, um, which is for us about um, out of the 1% uh, property tax that people pay, about $2 million is generated. And, and virtually half of that goes away. And we have, we have a bigger issue and I don't wanna get too far into it, but half of it goes away to education. And so, you know, even though we're left with a million dollars to have this contract uh, with Cal Fire, we're just barely, barely, you know, uh, in, in the, uh, in the uh, black. So, um, so again, I just wanted to comment that uh, with, with questions, you know, that, that are popping up regarding the Cal Fire contracts, they're not cheap. And oh, we too one other, have one other, one other thing is I, I'm very happy to see that Bodega Bay, there's a possible solution there. Uh, I was hoping for that and it's terrific that uh, it's moving in that direction. Um, also that, so people are aware because if you've always lived in a big city, you always think firefighters are paid. Just to let you know, 75% plus firefighters in the United States are volunteers. <clears throat> so it's uh, the vast majority are volunteers versus paid. Uh, Paul, could you speak a little about our volunteer base uh, and our average age, which is also up there? Okay. Right. Let, me just, let me just pop in and say it is 730 and this is very important. And I uh, appreciate um, that it's going long and I hope people stick with us. Go ahead, Paul. Yeah, our average age is around 60 also. Um, and so we you know, are trying to do everything we can not to age out. Uh, we're luckily, as people are sort of retiring from their volunteer service, we're able to bring in people that are in their 40s and 50s right now. Uh, and we have about um, 16 responders. Um, and, and again, we respond with CAL FIRE, uh, all as North Sonoma Coast Fire. Okay, okay. Um, and then me, I, um, I had two questions which were really touched on. Um, uh, Linda mentioned that um, uh, Timber Cove being, or implied that Timber Cove being a separate district isn't really the responsibility of the county to provide funding. I, that's what I read from what she said. And um, also that LAFCO recognizes um, the issues of Timber Cove and uh, the, the aging. Um, and I, I'm quite alarmed that um, Timber Cove is, is, is really closer to the cliff than maybe many realize. And um, that, um, that they, they need funding. Uh, they have a huge tourist uh, response schedule, and um, perhaps some of the TOT funds should, since they're not, uh, they're at the bottom of the schedule, uh, I think the July um, schedule for uh, distribution of the funds that would come up, I think November, for vote, um, they're at the very bottom, and um, other funding sources need to be um, found. Um, that's, that's what I wanted to add. Okay, so um, let's let's move to the um, public comments. But I, I want to be sure that the Bodega Bay um, people are uh, the chief and all um, get to speak first. If they could raise their hands, um, since we didn't speak earlier, they didn't speak earlier. John, testing one two. There you go. We have a little echo. John, please. Okay, well, uh, we'll deal with it and you can hear me twice. That way we can uh, double count the time that I'll be speaking because it won't be as long as most of you. Uh, first of all, thank you. Uh, one to Claudia and the tourism board. 
$75,000 for our ambulance. Very much appreciated and for the support as well. I never had that chance to tell you. And Linda, obviously uh, your help is very much appreciated as well, uh, shepherding and uh, your new information provided tonight renews a little bit of hope. And I thank you for that as well. Although I still find myself in a very uncomfortable position, I'm now working as a firefighter EMT to fill the gap created by multiple vacancies. Paramedic firefighter Jim Levy is working the remaining 10 hour shifts on the alter alternate days that I am working and also fulfilling his fire prevention duties. Our volunteers, Assistant Chief Steve Hersberg and Firefighter EMT Ray Hill, which I will pick on them because they are over 70, both of them, and they are our top responding volunteers and part of our night shift. So thank you to them as well. As you can see, many of us are pulling double duty. We're working at a level that is substandard and unsafe. To make matters worse, I can't recruit brand new firefighter paramedics for the current vacancies we have. This has never happened before. And in 30 years, I can say that. We are about to pass a preliminary budget, a budget that is very close to unbalanced, which means state law precludes us from passing an unbalanced budget. So that means we're gonna have to cut staffing to make room in the budget. Next year's budget will be far worse. And the third option I'm not gonna go into because I sincerely hope and pray that uh, Supervisor Hopkins options are gonna work out for us and we won't have to do that, which would be closing the doors. Thank you. Thank you. Was there another um, speaker from um, Adega Bay Fire? Can I just make a comment? Yes, Kathy. Briefly, um, I think it's been 20 years since we passed our fire tax that we, we've been paying, our community's been paying $525 per parcel for 20 years. We all stepped up to the plate to try to finance and support our paramedic fire district. That's all I wanted to say. Okay. Our, um, Josh, we've got Captain Storsinger there too. You asked if there's anybody else from the yes. Bay. Please. Thank you. Josh. Uh, Are you Captain? Meeting? Captain. Good evening. Yes. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, for those of you who don't know me, my name is Lou Storzinger. I am a fire captain with the Bodega Bay Fire Protection District. I'm also on the executive board of the Bodega Bay chapter of uh, Sonoma County Professional Firefighters Local 1401, which is our bargaining unit, our union that represents our career employees. Um, I have worked for Bodega Bay for 10 years now, and I have 24 years of public safety and military experience. In the 10 years that I've been here, this is the first time that I've seen a staffing reduction. Um, I, uh, as we refer to it, I ride the right seat of the engine. Um, I'm in command of it. I run the radios. I make the decisions. Uh, and lately, when I look to my left, I don't have my driver. I have my chief driving for me. Uh, this is way outside the industry standard. Um, while I appreciate Chief Grinnell's willingness to step up and hop on the rig and do the job with us, um, it's not his job. He's the fire chief. Uh, he has people that do that. Um, his job is to be out there to command. Uh, our staff that are currently left here are getting pushed to the breaking point. Um, it becomes harder every day to see the emotional, physical, and psychological toll that our staffing reduction has taken on our firefighters. To top it off, uh, since 2016, some of our firefighters have been out, most of our firefighters actually have been out to incidents that you will recall, such as the Clayton Fire, the Tubbs Fire, Oakmont, Nuns Canyon, Carr, Kincaid, Myers, Glass, the list goes on and on. Um, a healthy Bodega Bay Fire Protection District isn't just good for our employees and our residents, it's good for Sonoma County. We aren't just Bodega Bay firefighters, we're Sonoma County firefighters. Uh, it is only fair that we continue to move ahead and we continue to press for adequate staffing here on the coast. Uh, our union was extremely glad today, Supervisor Hopkins, to hear of the progress that was made. And we thank you for all that you have done to continue to push ahead for adequate and safe staffing here on the coast. Um, I, for one, leave my house uh, before every shift. And the last thing my wife says to me is, I love you, be safe. 
it's getting harder and harder to be safe out here. Uh, I mean, we're in desperate need of additional trained firefighters. So with that, I yield the rest of my time and thank you for the opportunity. Okay, thank you. Um, uh, um, Jason, is there, are there any hands raised from the public? We have, yes, uh, Damien Bourne. Okay, Damien. Hello, everybody. Um, can you hear me? Yes. All right. I'm a resident up in the, what I would call the Casadero or Coastal Hills. Um, my area is in the Fort Ross district. Uh, this area is pretty unique. It's a uh, difficult terrain. Uh, street stretches from top of King Ridge Road all the way down, <clears throat> excuse me, um, all the way down really into to the river, to Casadero and into the river. Um, and if we look at it more broadly, it's a similar terrain to what we see going all the way down into Occidental. Um, it really requires local knowledge uh, from people who deeply know this area in order to respond here. And I just wanted to let you guys know that we out here really do support consolidation down through Casadero and into Monterey. I think that's the, the best pathway to go. Um, these are people who work well together. Um, as uh, was already mentioned, Fort Ross is covering Casadero right now. Uh, many times we'll see uh, Steve Baxman coming up King Ridge. So uh, it's it's a it's an interesting situation uh, out here, but it I think that is uh, the better path to take. And I also wanted to just comment that uh, Bodega is real important to us too. A lot of people might think that North Coast uh, would be responding to a lot of us out here. Um, that's not the case. Um, when my son needed help, it was Bodega. So uh, we, we really do appreciate you folks. Thank you. Thank you. So Jason, is another hand okay. up? Okay. Yes, we have a couple more folks. Um, so we have Lyra Filippini. Lyra, go ahead and unmute yourself. Hi, again. Um, first, I want to express immense gratitude to Linda Hopkins for her ongoing attention on this coastal emergency services crisis. We recognize that you put a huge amount of problem solving and work into Measure B. We really appreciate that effort, and we hope we we're hopeful that the needed funding would, you know, come out of that solution. And honestly, we were devastated when it didn't pass because the crisis is very real. So thank you for continuing to work on this issue. It can't be easy to go through so much problem solving and then be back at the drawing board. So thank you for recognizing this crisis and prioritizing coastal safety. Our residents and visitors need the fast response to the dangerous coastal bluffs and shores that the BBFPD is specially trained to respond to. From ocean rescue to rappelling down cliffs, our BBFPD personnel are really incredible in how trained they are to respond to a huge variety of emergencies. The true crisis of this situation is that the demand for emergency response to the BPFPD's district is greatly unequal to the available funding for both the staffing required for those timely responses, as well as for replacing failing equipment. About 80% of the ambulance transports annually are for visitors to the area. These tourists generate a huge amount of taxes for the county, and our local residents are currently paying for the bill while also being taxed. We tax generating locals and tourists all deserve the fast and skilled emergency response that the BBFPD provides. I'm hoping that you CMAC reps will recognize that the BBFPD is in a uniquely dire financial situation in which it is truly in danger of dissolving. And if that happens, it will affect the entire Sonoma County coast. So thank you again, Linda, and thank you CMAC representatives for your time and careful consideration of this time pressing situation. Please vote to recommend to the Board of Supervisors the immediate allocation of funding for finalizing this consolidation so that our CMAC is on record supporting this need. Thank you. 
Thank you. Okay, we have next we have um, Tom and Prudy Tucker. Tom and Trudy. Unmute yourself. Tom? Tom? Unmute. Thank you. And I'd like to mention that uh, Trudy and I support uh, Linda Hopkins all the way to the governorship if she wants to go the direction. Sean, our chief, uh, we support you fully. You've supported CERT in our community, our, and Steve, you've supported our HAM uh, communication among our community, and the fire department has responded to all calls I have made for emergency services. Thank you. And uh, please, Linda, take this to the supervisors. Thank you. Thank you. I think there's one more, is that right, Jason? We don't have any hands raised, but we have um, four questions in the Q&A. And would you like me just to read all of them and have? I think so. Okay. So all are from anonymous attendee. The first is it is unfair to Bodega Bay taxpayers to keep the fire tax at $524 per lot while moving along and creating a temporary solution. Already over $300,000 has been spent on ballot measures for Bodega Bay fire. Uh, tax increases that have failed. Why can't the BBFPD be merged now? The problems of the district are not new, and the county is correct to insist on the consolidation of rural fire districts. Bite the bullet and incorporate BBFPD. The next is, if consolidation of BBFPD and SCFD is not physically possible, what about creating CAL FIRE support on the coast as the Sea Ranch has done? Next is in the county fire solution, would fire staff be rotated through different fire stations? And last, can we ask at the end of this meeting to please ask people as a general reminder to please work on weed and high grass removal as we are now into drought and wildfire season. Okay. Um... Jason, um, this is Cindy. I think Brian Lubitz has a comment. Yeah. Well, okay, comment, and then we'll ask for some answers from Mark and perhaps Linda, but go ahead. All right. Yeah, I know. I just wanted to sort of echo some of the ideas that were mentioned earlier, but um, just in, in, to say how important the consolidation is to, you know, our community here in Bodega Bay. Um, the, you know, if you look, especially in the holiday weekends where the traffic is so bad, um, if we had to wait for response times from uh, either Guerneville or Monterio or anywhere else. It's, you know, a dangerous situation. So I want to thank Supervisor Hopkins for her work. I know she's been working on this for basically since she, she started on, um, I mean, I moved, we came here in person in 2009 and this is already an issue. So this has been an issue for, you know, 12, 13, 14 years. So, um, I, you know, I want to thank everybody who's had to face this over and over again, especially the, the chief as well. Um, I know we have sort of a lot of work left to be done, but uh, I hope with this, this we can build a, a long-term solution so we have to be coming back to this again and again and again. So thank you very much. Okay, thank you. Um, Mark, um, if you can recall the, the questions that were read, um, you wanted sure. to comment? I'll, um, I'll try and be really quick. Um, you, I, I raised in the um, municipal service review that we did for West County agencies that you know, a $524 a year parcel tax in Bodega Bay is unsustainable, unfair, um, unequitable. Um, so I, I agree with that statement. Um, but stopping that tax or reducing that tax digs the hole deeper. Um, the second question was around CAL FIRE. And I think the best answer that you could look to is 
North Sonoma co coast. Um, you're just hiring professional firefighters and we don't have the money. So Cal Fire demands to be paid. They're not going to serve Bodega Bay or anywhere else um, without funding. Now, that being said, I want to just be really clear. Cal Fire is in our communities. They're staffing their stations during the fire season. The fire season is becoming longer and longer. And eventually, I think we're going to call the entire year the fire season. When they are staffed, they support all of our local agencies. But they're not here in the winter and they're not um, paramedics. So, you know, they, they are a resource but you gotta have the money to do that. Um, the last question was, why don't we do the um, consolidation now? And I'm gonna be really blunt. The board of the Sonoma County Fire District, which is an independent district, is not going to take on your problem um, without a solution to that problem. And I think if you were in their shoes, you would say the same thing. Um, I think they're to be congratulated to step up and say, we will take on Bodega Bay and we will bring our management, leadership, and administrative skills to the scene, um, but they will not take on a situation that um, is underfunded and is in crisis. They need the same solution that you do in order to complete the consolidation. Yeah. And, and, and I, I hope you don't consider that cynical. I, I just, that's the fact on the ground, I think. And, and I wanna pick up something on what Paul said. Um, first of all, CAL FIRE is very <laughs> escape themselves raises. They will become even more expensive. Um, they are not the same cross-trained paramedic force in this area that we need. Um, they have in other parts of the state done medical response, but really essentially right now for us, we need this paramedic ambulance service out here. If you take us out of here and you simply put a, a firefighting force in here, it's going to cost more money and you're going to lose that paramedic um, transport rescue service. Um, and as to one of the questions that was asked, why don't we do it now? Uh, we've been waiting two years to do this. Um, I think if we had been able to pull this off two years ago, uh, we probably would have saved four or five of the paramedics who left in the last few years. I mean, that we are hemorrhaging paramedics and now we can't rehire them. That's why this morning's hope, um, which you know, hope is not a strategy, but we're hopeful. And I think we're developing a strategy and we're going to get there but we need this consolidation to finish. Cal, Cal Fire is not an answer. They're a more expensive entity. And really most of the calls we have involve this ambulance in one way or the other. Uh, the other thing I wanted to point out again is that we are a county resource. Let us not forget that. And our ambulance is a county resource. Um, so when you have those big fires like in Tubbs, um, there, were, there were two fire qualified ambulances for in, in that fire area for the first, I think, 24 to 30 hours. One of them was ours, the other was from Russian River. Petaluma had an ambulance in for a short period of time, but it turned over to, to firefighting. Um, so we have to see this not, I think that one of the challenges Supervisor Hopkins has is, you know, it's not my problem for other supervisors. It is everybody's problem right now. If we go under, uh, the county loses a cross-trained ambulance that responds in the hot and warm zones of fires. So I just want to point that out. Um, it could not have, I mean, believe me, from our perspective, um, consolidation was essential when we first went through the LAFCO process. Um, it's, it's more essential now because now we can't hire. Okay, uh, I see that Josh has, uh, from Bodega, has arrived and he has his hand up. Um, Josh, uh, could you take two minutes? Yeah, sorry, I don't have any prepared statements and anything going forward, but I do have a question. Um, you know, I support everything as far as funding for all fire departments in this county. Um, and I was just curious, maybe somebody in this uh, forum can answer is, why can't the county just fund fire going forward um, forever based on funds they already have? Uh, why, why did I keep throwing money at these different fire districts and volunteer fire departments on a two year basis only and not for the future? Um, can they not tap uh, existing funds to fund the departments without going to the county for additional tax? I think this uh, county is overtaxed, and I don't think that fire tax is ever going to pass. Um, I feel like they, you know, they have no problem spending $30 million a year on the homeless or spending whatever the budget is for um, advertising for the Sonoma County Tourism Board, five, six, seven million dollars a year, but um, are unwilling to spend um, five to ten million dollars on the fire. Okay, thank you. 
Jason, is there any, are there any other hands raised? And I see, is there something on Facebook? Um, we do have a um, couple of comments on Facebook uh, from Jason Sailing. Um, one is JPAs make perfect sense. The next is the issue might be 500K per firefighter. Is that what was said? That makes zero sense when 75% of firefighters are unpaid. And uh, Linda defined the difference between dependent versus independent districts in regards to the legal county funding obligation. And were there others you wanted to read? We don't no. have any in the Q&A. Okay, Linda has her hand raised. Thank you very much, um, Chairman. So I wanted to cover a couple of things, which is number one, I think the question about taxes, which you know is a fair point. And I recognize that you know in California in general, we do have a lot of different forms of taxes. Um, however, I can say that after a recession and a series of repeat disasters at the county level, we are actually running a pretty lean operation. We have time and time again asked department heads to make cuts. We have, you know, sort of slimmed down the number of employees. We have tightened up the budget and we have tightened our belts. And so at the end of the day, we don't have sort of $3 million that we can grab of ongoing revenue to immediately solve a problem. It takes really strategic um, sort of development of funds over time, looking at things like increases to Prop 172 or potential growth of TOT in the future. Those are the kinds of revenues that we're looking at currently um, to potentially help fund fire services. You know, um, the, the question would literally be like, you know, do you want to take money from paving roads, which is, you know, a legal requirement of the county? Do you want fewer sheriff's deputies, fewer district attorneys, you know, longer delays in terms of criminal justice processing times, um, you know, less mental health services? The county has a legal mandated by law obligation to provide mental health care for severe and persistent um, mentally disabled folks and, um, and people with severe and persistent mental illness. And also that does factor into our requirement to help with housing and sheltered and help addressing the mental illness that we see um, on our streets of Sonoma County. And so I recognize that homelessness isn't as big of a problem along the coast. It's a huge problem in the lower Russian river and actually it creates a fire hazard if we don't have these people inside because they create fires to warm themselves or to cook food. And those fires have started wildfires in Sonoma County. Um, over the past year, we struggled with this tremendously in Monterio. So there are very real impacts of homelessness and um, we are making progress on the homelessness solution. So that's why we're doing what we can within the confines of our existing budget, but we are also looking at a potential fire sales tax because we're, we're underprepared right now for the fire reality that we live in today and for the level of tourism that we are also seeing in some of our unincorporated areas during wildfire season. So I think that we need to get very serious about vegetation management, wildfire risk reduction, visitor education, and partnership with Sonoma County Tourism and regional parks. Um, there are some great models around the state, actually, of folks that have mandatory visitor education, for instance, and vacation rentals surrounding how to be a good neighbor. We could provide information about you know, emergency alert and warning and fire risk reduction in, in those forms as well. So um, it, you know, I know it sucks that the answer is usually we need new revenue sources, but Unless there are specific things that you can say, we don't need this, let's pull it from here. Um, it's kind of a hypothetical conversation. So, but I'm always open to suggestions. So if you have suggestions on programs at the county that you think should be cut, let me know. And I would be happy to look into it with our budget team. Okay. Um, does this bring us to a, a point of um, conclusion? <laughs> The saga goes continues, but I, I think it's important that uh, we were all here together with the public um, to talk about this. And um, I hope that we're able to, to see the uh, firefighting uh, emergency services issues as a, a, a total community, a total county and, um, and work together to, to really do the best that we can. I thank you for everybody uh, speaking uh, and we'll um, move on. Um, and so now we have, we're moving on to uh, staff reports. Elise and Leah uh, will, Elise will speak to um, general representative changes and Leo will give us an LCP update, status update. Uh, Elise. 
Thank you, Chair Farmer. Um, we just wanted to point out that uh, we wanted to welcome Liz Gallagher, who is now a full MAC representative. Uh, Cal Aries from Jenner has stepped down. This means that we are open now for an alternate uh in the jenner position so if you are from jenner and are listening and interested in participating in the mac as an alternate this year please uh please contact us and we will uh we'll move you through that process we also have a new um alternate um that is scheduled to be appointed for bodega bay beth rizzoni rizzoni uh, bodega bodega so so sorry i know that that's a I know that thing. um yeah, uh, she's going to be appointed, I think, June uh, 13th, if I got that right. So, um, so we've got some movement, and thank you so much for your time and commitment. All of your MAC representatives volunteer a lot of time and energy in, in being this important communication conduit for um, the district, and we appreciate your hard work very, very much. That's my update for the day. Okay, Leo, LCP. Sure. I'll be really brief because Linda did go over the key LCP items. Um, basically, the board is hearing an update um, next week um, on May 25th, and that set of materials is available. Um, I'll, I'll go ahead and post it in the link. I'd also put it in the Q&A, but there's a number of attachments, including the summary report, which people may want to read, as well as some of the other supporting documents. Um, I'll share screen just for a second, because to me, I think one of the things that's useful is just to see the overall timeline. So this is pulled from the PowerPoint um, attachment that they provided. Um, and uh, you can see that they're um, going to the board for this kind of update. Then they're going back to the planning commission um, with an updated document. And then the board, again, in late, August after they um, incorporate whatever the planning commission recommends. Um, and then they're slated for the coastal commission in November. So I know that it feels like this has been going on for an extremely long time, but um, there are still steps in the process um, where these issues are gonna be, continue to be talked about. Continue to be talked about. Oh. Okay, thank you. Thanks. Scott, I'm sorry. I think when I was trying to mute myself, I muted you. So um, please unmute yourself. We couldn't hear you. Okay, got it. Uh, restating, um, moving on. Um, uh, Marty, uh, if you could report on the ad hoc committee for resuming meeting in person. Uh, there was It was in the packet, but Marty, uh, would you like to speak to it? Yes, let me make sure I'm unmuted. You are. Uh, the ad hoc was um, Paul Placos, myself, Ann Yeager, and Liz uh, Gallagher from Jenner. And um, we uh, divided our discussion into several issues, which are summarized in the document in the packet. And it's fair to say that we didn't all agree with each other, so we don't have a specific recommendation. And um, I think all of the concerns that were raised in our ad hoc meeting are reasonable. And we think that the group as a whole should discuss this. Um, uh, we all agreed that um, we'll likely not be ready by the June 15th opening about uh, announced by Governor Newsom to reach a decision. We talked about safety issues, both COVID related safety issues uh, about um, if we're meeting wholly in person or in a hybrid manner, how can we assure that the people in the in-person meeting um, have been fully vaccinated and are safe? Uh, there's questions about whether or not it's legal for us to do that and how we would do that. We had questions about suitability of meeting locations. Uh, if, if we're gonna be, meet 
inside or outside, how we'll accomplish social distancing, uh, questions about availability of Wi-Fi, um, both for um, a hybrid meeting arrangement and also for uh, uh, broadcasting on uh, Facebook, for example, uh, we'll need to review the locations that we've been uh, meeting in and decide which ones are appropriate. We also talked about safety issues that aren't COVID related, um, especially in the winter when uh, it's dark, uh, both uh, arriving and departing from the meeting in bad weather, uh, whether we should address a potential al alternate time for the meetings uh, during the dark months and the hopefully rainy months. Um, we talked about a hybrid approach and uh, later on after the meeting, I've talked extensively with Elise about this. Um, we noticed that more people are from the public are attending these meetings as Zoom meetings than attended when they were in-person meetings. And we'd like to preserve that availability of the meeting, whether the members of the MAC meet in person or not. Um, we, we like certain aspects of the Zoom relationship uh, better than uh, just uh, watching and having to type your questions in the way it's done on Facebook. So there are a lot of issues to discuss. According to Elise, the county is actively involved in figuring out um, a hybrid approach that would work and uh, reviewing what kind of technology is required to do that effectively. So she and Scott uh, both suggested that we refer uh, defer a group discussion of the issues involved uh, uh, to hopefully um, the July meeting. Yeah, to defer it until we have a, 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 a technological solution. Yes, when, uh, mm -hmm. until we have uh, a decision from the county about what makes sense technologically. And there are issues about um, interference getting introduced if all the uh, MAC members, for example, bring their own device to the meeting. Um, so it's more complicated than uh, first appears when you think about having a hybrid approach. Okay, so we'll, we'll keep the uh, ad hoc open until that time. Yeah, I think that makes sense. And I'll be communicating with at least, and at the point uh, that we have more information about um, the approach the county endorses, uh, we'll call another meeting of the ad hoc before our next full meeting and see what we come up with. Thank you. Um, so moving on, uh, I'm gonna sunset the land use events ad hoc committee in light of the new standing committee format. So at this point, I'd like to call for uh, two um, uh, council members or alternates to stand as the two um, stable members of the new land use committee. Are there any people that would like to step forward? I'll do it. Okay. I'll do it. Brian, anyone Chuck. else? Sorry, Jay. Okay. Okay. okay, that's two people down south. Um, so uh, that's fine. We'll start there, and uh, we'll, I'll um, connect with the two of you so we can uh, understand the process together and get going. Okay, Elise. Okay, so moving on, um, call for new agenda items. Each time uh, in the interest of openness and uh, is to have 
any opportunity for um, suggesting agenda items for future meetings. Uh, this is an opportunity now and at any time you can reach out to a representative, um, uh, Elise, uh, and bring up topics that you'd like to be um, included in an agenda. Is there anyone that has from the public or the council that has a topic they'd like to include? Okay, well, the, t the opportunity is always there. Liz? I see. I, I'm sure I must have something, but I can't think of anything right now. <laughs> okay, well, let us know. Um, Check our I group. See, I see that Josh has his hand raised. Is, if he has a comment to what we're speaking to, um, this is a chance for you to, to speak. No, sorry, I had my hand up from my previous comment. Um, okay. I know it's, side, I know it's sidetracked, but it was just a follow-up question for Linda Hopkins based on a response from my question. And it was just a response of, uh, of that $30 million that we're spending on the homeless. I think we can all agree that we need to spend money on this important issue. But I was just curious of that $30 million, of, if any of that money is being reimbursed from the state or federal um, budgets. And if not, is this a one-time expense or is this an ongoing issue? And if it is an ongoing issue, that um, shows the, where their priorities are. Yeah, as far this is, as, this is uh, off topic for the moment, but I, I'm sure if you reach out to her office directly that she can respond to you. I invite you to, um, to do so. Anything else? Okay, Cindy, was there a procedural question that we missed? Yes, I, I, and I'm sorry, I don't know how I forgot. When we voted on the approval of the agenda and the minutes, I forgot to ask for a motion in a second. And I, I think probably, I don't think we need to vote over, but we probably should have a, uh, for both of those, someone that made a motion. Oh. Am I incorrect? Someone... Sorry for the error. So I'll do the first. Brooks, Brooks moves. Who's second? second. <laughs> okay, Kathy who was second. the first? Brooks and Kathy. Okay, okay, just a minute. And then I need also uh, a motion for the, uh, and a second for the, the meeting minutes. Motion. Jay. 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 Second. Second. Okay. Great. I saw Brooks hand. Okay, great. Okay. Then we can move quickly on to the adjournment. Do I have a motion to adjourn? <laughs> Kathy. Okay. I so move that we adjourn. Second. And a second. Jay, by voice. Okay, okay. Yep. and let's I'll quickly go through. So uh, Jay. Yes. Okay, Scott. Yes, yes. Marty. Yes. Paul. Yes. Abby. Yes. Wanda? Yes. Uh, Liz? Yes. Brooks? Yes. And Kathy? Yes. Okay. Thank, Thank you. you. And we're Thank you, everybody. I really, well. I was hoping to get done by 730. We didn't make it. <laughs> it was I'll a do lot, better. But it was, it was, it was great. Really it was important. Important Carol. agenda items. Thank you, Scott, so much. Yeah. Good night. Yes. Thank you. Thanks, Scott. Take care. Bye, everyone. Good night. Bye. Good night. Good night. Um, night. Night. Thanks all for another good meeting. Thank you, Elise. <laughs>